things that have already happened. Um, so as we are um, the LCR4 Start Project, we have a number of partners. Um, I'm based at John Moores University with um, Eve Money, and she's on their call as well. Um, and we have, um, we're based in Faculty of Engineering Technology, and we're really lucky because we've got lots of expertise and knowledge um, within engineering, maths and computer science, um, built environments. You know, that's just in our faculty. And we're also linked, you know, obviously we've got other faculties, um, but we're based there. And we've got um, Natasha Sutton, um, from the business clinic and Jan Brown will be coming later as well from um, the business school to talk about um, sort of marketing strategies as well. So we are, we're very lucky that we've got all that support um, and we, we sort of where the link really from the industry bringing you into the academic world. And we have the partners which are um, STFC which um, unfortunately, I don't think Angela's going to be able to make it, but if there's anything you need from, from there, um, we can pass those in, sort of inquiries over. Um, and that's very um, sort of high level, high computing type stuff. So you know, it's all very relevant to the digital world. And we have the Virtual Engineering Centre at University of Liverpool, who um, are the lead partner on the project. And they do obviously, well, virtual engineering, but they have a wealth of experience in different um, areas as well. Um, and then obviously we have the um, growth platform with probably Danielle helping us. So we, she links into all the, um, the support around the, you know, if we can't help, we can pass you over to the other business me and support mechanisms across the, um, the region. Um, so that's the project. It's the RDF funded. So we have to fill out lots and lots of um, paperwork and um, to evidence the support we're, de we're delivering and in what impact we're, make, we're making um, and you know it's um, you know we, we are you know not free support but you know we can help with lots of challenges and move forward with um, you know that you know, that support is available anyway um, enough from me I was hoping that everybody would be happy enough to say hello and ex um, explain where they're coming where what business they're coming from so that everyone gets a feel for who's here because um, you know we can't, we don't get the opportunity to have a coffee and stand around and network. So, um, can I, I'll, I'll start with the um, the attendees, if that's okay, because we do have um, specific slots for all the um, solution providers and the you know um, speakers. So, if I start with on the top of my list is um, Moise. Barbara Ramos from Drill Surgeries. Are you here? Yeah, yeah that's me. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, how do you say your name? It, it's Moises. Okay, hi. Hi, Moises. Yeah, hi. Do you want to say hello, explain where you're coming from and you know, what your background is? Yeah, definitely. So I'm the founder of Drill Surgeries. We started in 2019 and we do research and development for medical devices. We are currently based in Liverpool. And our main challenges nowadays is that we are actually expanding our team. We are hiring people. And because of COVID, all this process is being done online. And most of the work will be done also remotely because uh, we are in lockdown. So I hope I can get some insight from the digital uh, community and connoisseur of yours to improve all this process. Thank you. Great, thanks, Moise. So the next person we've got on my list is Keith Brady. Is Keith here? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Hi, Keith. Yeah. Hi, yeah, uh, Keith Brady. I'm founder and managing director of Better Sports Coach uh, Limited, uh, which is basically a subscription video on demand service, which provides education in, in all aspects of sport, sports science, coaching, health and fitness. Uh, we work with professors, doctors, uh, PhD students, down to MSc students, or people with significant experience in coaching. Uh, and we put them on video, teaching what they know. And it's a, sub well, at the moment it's pay-per-view, but it will eventually be a subscription service. Okay, thanks, Keith. Um, and um, Mark Carr from Bardo, are you around? 
So I don't think Mark's been able to join. No, not yet. Okay, then. Um, oh, Tracy Fishwick's here. Tracy? Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. I'm um, Tracy Fishwick. I'm the Managing Director of a social enterprise called Transform Company. We're based in Liverpool um, in uh, Blackburn House on Hope Street. You might know if you are, uh, if you know the city well. Um, we are seven years old as a company. Um, we're small, there's eight or nine of us. And we work with people in communities around the city region who are uh, unemployed. So um, normally that's been people who are long-term unemployed. Now <laughs> we're in a situation where we are uh, helping lots of other people who never expected to be unemployed um, and there's a big sort of overlap with health and well-being the two things tend to go together as well um, a year ago everything we did was in the room with people in groups one-to-one -one coaching conversations and if you told me that we would all be working remotely a year later still I would have said we'd have gone bust we haven't, but, and we've done really well, but I'm here to just find out if there are other things that we can do, because I think this is the new normal. <laughs> um, and obviously a lot of the people we work with are digitally excluded. And so we've got a challenge. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for that, Trace. That's one of the things that we sort of picked up, wasn't it, Danielle? That you knew it's great for us. We're in a large organization. We go home, we switch our laptops on and we get connected to everything that we would have had in our workplace. And, but then you're working with different people and in different settings that don't have that technology and that access to it. Um, you know, we know a lot of the schools, you know, children don't all have a laptop and don't have Wi-Fi at home. So, you know, it, it is hard sometimes when you just think everyone's the same. So hopefully you'll help get some ideas from today. Thanks for that. Um, okay, next up, Barbara Gardner. Barbara Gardner Sharp, is she here? We do training. No. Dokey. Um, um, Leon. I think Leon's here, isn't he, from this, the sales dojo? Yeah, you can't miss my big fat heads. Leon from uh, the sales dojo. Hello, everyone. Good morning. David, you have got the coolest, David Tully, you've got the coolest video thing there that keeps glitching. It looks like you've got it set up. It's amazing. It looks boss. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Leon. I run something called the Sales Dojo. Sales Dojo, we set up about four years ago to help people to close more sales, hit more targets, get paid more commission, and buy more new shoes. Uh, in 2019, we decided we needed to make that passion something more of a business. So we registered as a business, set it up, put some money in to build a website, which was going to be used for leading people to our in-person events. We were doing them all over Liverpool. So we're doing them in the Shankly Hotel and we were doing them in the Liver Building. And then um, just as we made the first payment for the website to do one thing with the, web, the sales dojo, COVID came about about three days later. So everything that we were doing in person and the plans to get people in rooms fell apart. Um, I've been speaking with Danielle and Lee and they've been really helping me with some ideas and options for making it more digital. I'm here today to learn how we can really make that sing. I've messaged Keith because I think we've got a very similar business model. Keith, I've dropped your line on LinkedIn. I think it might be worth us comparing notes, mate. Thank you. Well, that's great. Thanks, Leon. And um, that, that's great if you can start linking together and making business to business opportunities as well. Um, okay, who's next on my list? It's Jay from um, Agent Marketing. Are you here today? No? Okay, don't um, And I think the rest of us um, are talking now um, anyway, or you know, participating in the, the de demonstrations. Just a quick, um, perhaps it'd be worth just, uh, we've got the opportunity now to introduce the panel and the discussion and um, people who are presenting. Um, first up, it will be um, Hashang, Dr. Hashang Kolavand. Hashang, are you around? Hello, everyone. Uh, Hi, Hashang. Do you want to introduce yourself? Is yeah. Sam with you as well? Yes, yes. 
Okay, uh, good morning all. Uh, my name is Rushan Kornivan. Uh, I'm from the Department of Computer Science, Liverpool John Moss University. My research area is uh, human computer interaction, uh, animal computer interaction, brain computer interaction, and in general, is animal uh, human computer interaction. I work particularly in augmented and virtual reality and IoT. Uh, we support uh, companies and industry by consultancy for applying for any bids and also for uh, developing any software. Uh, this is from me and I would like to introduce my uh, perspective a student, uh, Hesam Raskari, who is here. He will explain a little bit about what we have done uh, for industry in the UK and in other countries later. Uh, this is from me. Thanks, Shashan. Hassan, are you here? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. And this is uh, Hassan, as you can see, and uh, I am uh, Work as a technical manager in a hub company, the first and biggest communication company in Iran. And uh, we were working on developing Android application and also backend uh, uh, for, uh, especially for uh, AI VR technology. Of course, we have a part of job on uh, IoT and uh, uh, about. Uh, about uh, four years ago, since four years ago, I was uh, working on uh, uh, AR technology with uh, AR SDKs, and uh, recently I'm working on a project uh, that uh, we call it Can. It's in UK and it's based on AR technology. Thank you so much. Right, thanks, Sam. Um, okay, Dave, do you want to introduce yourself? Dave Tully. Hey, everyone. Uh, yeah, I just want to say, firstly, Leon, uh, I wish it was some kind of cool effect. I just dropped the camera the other day and it's broke. <laughs> the joys of uh, yeah, not getting in uh, Amazon Prime to get a new one. So, but yeah, so um, I was going to say for now, do you want us to just introduce ourselves, Leslie, or do we want to go through uh, it's a small little presentation that I've done? or? Um, if you could just introduce yourself first, then everyone can um, know who's here, and then we can come back to the um, presentations, if that's Yeah, it. that's perfect. Yeah, Sam. So, you. yeah, I'm uh, Dr. David Tully. I run Seengraft Studios, based in Birkenhead now, because our building got shut down in Liverpool City Centre. It's a great place, as you can see, looks a bit like a shed that we're in, uh, which is, a, it's a cool shed. And we do virtual reality, augmented reality, and trying to bridge the gap between one, academic research is what I used to do. I uh, quit that in basically January last year and then COVID hit, all the joys of good time and eh? And then, yeah, just working with great clients, just building experiences just to get them out and about either on online through 3D technologies. And that's what I'll be talking about later on through our GPU cloud Sweet, That's me. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Um, Chris, Chris Morland from Citrus Suite. Hello, everybody. Um, so yeah, I'm Chris from Citrus Suite. Citrus Suite have been um, building apps, software systems, and websites for for around twelve years now. Um, a, a lot of the focus of our work are digital, digital transformation projects um, for organisations that typically have a process embedded um, that needs a digital solution to make it more kind of optimised and efficient. Um, Quite a lot of the work we do is actually in the healthcare sector, um, working with hospitals, NHS trusts, pharmaceutical companies um, to build solutions um, to make life easier for kind of patients. Uh, so, yeah, keen to kind of share some of our experiences over, over the last year, really, and um, being a digital agency. I think we, we were very much used as a bit of a sounding board, I guess, when the pandemic hit and lots of organisations realised they'd need to start um, delivering solutions and, and ideas online. So we, 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 we're definitely kind of keen to help out in that area as well. So, yeah, that's, that's me. 
Thank you. Um, Natasha, are you around? Are you able to introduce yourself? Hey, yeah, I'm Natasha from the Liverpool Business School. So I work in the business clinic at the minute and our intention is to help uh, local businesses in the Liverpool city region uh, with elements of the business strategy, whether that be marketing, digital marketing um, or research. Uh, at the moment, we do that through student projects. So we have a lot of students who work with organisations free of charge, um, but we're also hoping to start running some courses as well to also help people in the city region. Thanks, Sasha. Um, um, we've got Dr. Thomas Hughes. Roberts, are you here, Tom? Yeah, hi, everybody. So I'm, uh, I'm Tommy Roberts, also from the School of Computer Science and Mathematics. Um, and I'm uh, primarily doing research in virtual reality and human computer interaction. But I'm also here representing the Live Lab, which is a platform for evaluating the user experience. So I'll be talking about some uh, technology and methods that you can use to kind of um, understand the impact of technology on your end users and think about uh, what changes could be made and what other avenues of support could be provided. Thanks, Tom. Um, okay, I don't know who Christine Baudry's here yet, so um, we'll introduce I'm here, Oh, you are here, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Can I introduce yourself quickly um, and then we'll come, come back to discussions and presentations. Sure. Hi, I'm Christine Baudry. So I'm the founder of YogaBots, which is a, an app that is a multi content platform for companies to address their health and well-being issues. Um, so that conveniently launched last year, but we've been in the mix for about four years, but you'll hear a little bit more about that when we move on to the panel discussion later. Sorry. <laughs> um, we've got high impact. So Simon and Dion, are you here? We are, yes. Um, so yeah, as you said, that's Simon from High Impact. Uh, nice to see everyone this morning uh, and a few faces that I recognize, um, like Dave. Um, you definitely see some cool stuff from him coming up. He always blows my mind with his virtual and augmented reality stuff. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm here with Dion. Uh, we're from High Impact, uh, which is an education consultancy based on the Wirral. Um, we have um, had to go through a lot internally um, over the last year with changing our delivery methods. Um, we're working with schools training teachers, but also training those teachers to be able to then deliver their content online as well. So it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely been a big learning curve. Um, so hopefully we can share some ideas that will help other people from that. Um, we also have an in-house media team and an in-house learning and development team as well. So all of those things combined to hopefully yeah, provide some interesting and engaging kind of content that um, we can share with you today. Thanks, Simon. Is Andy on there as well to say hello? Hello. <laughs> hi, I'm here. Sorry, I didn't think I'd be introduced. Uh, hi, I'm Dion. As Simon just said, I work with him um, and I do all of our marketing and business development sales side of our business. So as Simon said, we work in education and media and provide virtual solutions for people as well. So, Thanks, Dion. Um, also, I'm going to introduce our um, partners, but um, Christine Walters, are you here still? I, um, I always think you're in our team, but you're not. <laughs> so, <laughs> still here. <laughs> Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi. Hi, yeah, I'm Chris Walters, and um, I work for LJMU, um, previously delivering the Activate project, which has just recently finished. So, I am actually still with the business school, uh, and I'm just actually researching a project ready to be launched soon. So, I'm just kind of sitting in and listening today um, and hopefully our new project that we're researching will be interesting going forward so that's all really I can say today <laughs> you know just nice to see everybody as well oh thanks Chris and um, so I think Dan is here from the, the Bachelor Engineering Centre Dan are you here um uh, so good morning everyone thanks for organizing this Leslie um, so I'm Dan I'm one of the industrial engagement managers at the virtual engineering center we're a partner on the, the project this is about um, like Leslie was mentioning we've got an expertise in a, a variety of digital tools from visualization systems integration augmented reality so I think the most relevant bit of our work to this discussion has been the work we've been doing with AI training be that with some big clients like um, Sellafield Limited looking at 
what can you do in terms of training people on expensive big pieces of equipment without letting them near it before they're trained? So doing virtual reality and um, sort of hardware enabled where somebody sits in a chair with all the controls that look like they're in a big expensive piece of equipment, but you don't have to take that out of the workflow in order for them to use it. I'm actually going to have to drop off for half an hour now because of a call from the nuclear industry for more projects in this area of digitally enabled training. So it's something that's going from right from the smallest businesses uh, to the top. I'll stick something in the chat that absolutely blew my mind yesterday. I think one of the challenges of VR enabled training is that you often lose your face in the wearing of a mask and your facial expressions. And a tech demo from Unreal, somebody showed me yesterday as to how very human-like avatars that trace your facial expressions so that a smile is a smile and a frown is a frown could be perhaps, you know, it's not this year's job for anybody, but a sign of things to come in the way that remote training could be delivered. But otherwise, I'm hoping to help anybody who's interested in the follow-up sessions later today. Thanks, Dan. Um, and then there's Eve, are you here still? Can you say hello? Hi, I'm Eve. I work with Lee on, um, in John Moore's on the LCR Full Start programme. I do kind of support stuff and all the compliance stuff. So I'm just here to make sure we're all ARDF compliant. Uh, thank you. And Danielle, do you want to have a quick intro? Yeah, so I work, I'm Danielle. I work at the growth platform. Um, some of you might know it better as the LEP, as it was formerly known, had a rebrand in the last year or so. Um, and basically what our role is, is to bridge the gap between local governments and businesses like yourselves from a variety of different sectors. I work in the advanced manufacturing team on LCR full start, but that's not to say that I can't always guide people in other directions if people ever want to sort of use me as an entry point to the growth platform, see what kind of support is out there for you outside start. I can help with that as well. But my role is mainly to sort of do a diagnostic period where we figure out how you can enhance your digital strategy. Well, thanks, Danielle. No, I'm really sorry if I missed anybody. Is there anyone that hasn't said hello that wants to say hello? <laughs> okay, then. So um, we'll go through to our first um, sort of talk, which is from uh, Dr. Hashang um, Kolaband and his student, um, Hassan Resto. Oh, Leslie, I think Angela's just arrived. If... Oh, Angela. Morning, everyone. I need to stay off the I'm sorry, I've got really rubbish broadband. Wouldn't believe I worked for in supercomputing, would you? <laughs> so um, my name's Angela Walsh. I'm um, one of the business development managers that works for STFC, and I'm based at the Hartree Centre, which is um, a high-performance computing facility that does AI, um, machine learning, visualisation, et cetera. And also on, on site, we have an um, additive manufacturing facility um, for 3D printing. Thank you. Thanks, Angela, that explains it a bit better than that than I did before. Um, but I think that's everyone. So, um, Hashang and Hassan, are you, have you got some sort of a little presentation for us? Are you still here? I will leave it. Hello, uh, I will leave it to Hassan because I have a lecture and I have to leave, unfortunately, but uh, Hassan will continue with this. Hassan, are you ready to go? Thank you. Um, sorry, yes. Yeah. Okay, it was nice meeting you, but we will catch up with you some later. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, man. Yes, I sound go ahead. Yes. Can everybody yes. see him and hear him. <laughs> yeah. Actually, as I said, uh, as you know, uh, we were working on a project uh, for my uh, PhD program, and uh, it's about an AR uh, application. Actually, it's a, a, a project about a psychological, and uh, it has a lot of page that we want to build a magic book from it, and uh, it's a famous uh, category of AR technology. Uh, we will use uh, Euphoria SDK on this, and we, we have uh, a lot of uh, options to do that, but the best thing is that I think we can use it is, uh, uh, was uh, Euphoria, 
uh, we use many technology, many, many features that include it. And uh, we want to use something new and we want to use something uh, that we can show details uh, of something that we cannot uh, see in a limited screen like mobile screen or uh, or TV screen or uh, computer screen. We, we want to uh, get rid of these uh, and we want to use full space uh, of uh, environment that we have and, and, and augmented something that we want uh, on uh, something that we want to show our clients or even patients. And uh, if I want to uh, say uh, how we can do this project, uh, something that is important in this project is about uh, details and make a connection between user and uh, our system. Uh, actually, we, uh, we, we want to use uh, a dynamic object, creating dynamic object uh, on a result screen as something that we will get and uh, in the last of the project. And uh, we have, uh, actually we have, uh, uh, many pages with uh, many technologies. Actually, we want to use uh, custom uh, elements of this. But the last thing that I want to use in this project and the most thing uh, new is about uh, something like uh, uh, generating a 3D object that never uh, has been created on runtime. And uh, uh, we want to see something is on another place in front of uh, and it was something uh, new is about uh, something like uh, generating a three D object that. Can everybody hear Hassan? Um, I'm not getting a very good signal. No. It's actually stopped now. You cannot hear me? Mm. It keeps breaking up. I don't know, but um, is everyone else getting a clear signal? No. Um, Hassan, it's quite sort of slow and we we're struggling to um, hear, I think. The connection's quite poor. Cool. I mean, I didn't get that. Yeah. Um, so, shall, should we perhaps come back maybe later if we can see if we can get a better connection and move on to um, to the next potential solution from Dave, if that's okay? okay. Thanks, to Sam. If you don't, we'll get back in a bit. Thank you. Cool. Uh, am I allowed to share my screen? Yes, please. Amazing. Let's give us a few seconds. Cool. Can everyone see that? Yeah. Sweet. Awesome source. Welcome. Right. So, yeah, as I said, I'm uh, Dr. David Sully and I run Scenegraph Studios. And in short, we build epic, you know, interactive experiences to hopefully blow people's minds. Currently, you know, we seem to be doing quite well, uh, building up the team uh, each month uh, going through. Uh, yeah, so the main thing why I started this company was to basically try and help people bridge the gap between the technologies of game development, the advances of it all, 3D technologies. I loved it, uh, and I just want to make sure like everyone else loves it and knows everything available from that. So in short, 
we take care of all the business for you, uh, all the technologies, why you can just spend time with your family and do things that matter, i.e. build your own businesses. So we've been working with quite a lot of clients over the last year, uh, all doing 3D experiences, either through websites, virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, and then websites, uh, but mainly just the back-end uh, technologies of it all. So you can kind of think of us as being... Uh, creative technicians, I'd say, is a pretty decent word to put through it. Uh, currently, we offer quite a lot of services, you know, bespoke applications uh, from virtual reality, augmented reality, games, basically anything 3D. But we're actually stepping away from the services and more building products want to uh, sell from a, a purely, I want to say, selfish point of view. But, you know, having this income coming from a different source than purely project based uh, manufacturing. Uh, and this is where we're going for. So we've got Pitch 4D interactive presentations. So we leveraged Unreal Game Engine to allow you to import your presentations into fully interactive scenes. And that's what I'll be chatting about today. Also, Scan Me See Me, augmented reality through web browsers. We've actually partnered with another company called Team Creative to bring forward amazing machines, which is augmented reality um, posters, wall art, uh, going from different themes. But the idea about that is you don't need an app to download, you know, very bloated. It just scans through your barcode scanner. And I would say the, the only good thing that's kind of happened to us from COVID is now that everyone knows how to use a QR code without having to download some crazy QR code scanner. It's just all built inside of your phone. And then what we're actually launching now is our remote desktop as a service. So, you know, creating experiences takes a lot of time. You know, you need expensive equipment, uh, some decent PCs. And a lot of the time when we're kind of looking into it, a lot of clients just don't have that uh, available. So I'll come back to that in a second. So Pitch 4D. What does it actually allow you to do? Well, in short, at the minute, we create bespoke applications. Uh, that take your presentation slides and place them inside of 3D worlds to either present, as what you can see down there with my lovely face directly in the 3D application, or we can uh, rip out all Zoom calls from the people and place them within experiences just to experience things slightly differently. Um, and then, yeah, basically stand out. So fully 3D, uh, 3D interactive scenes, import all your CAD models. So we're pushing this towards more like engineering, virtual tours, uh, anything that, you know, you need 3D to sell your stuff. So just show a small little video. And I'll come back to like a lot more uh, cool stuff. So the idea of it, you give us your slides, place it within the 3D scenes. And again, this is just a, a little capture, nothing too crazy. We build them all up for you, but you can walk around it because we always hated the idea of being able to, you know, teach physics and AI by teaching at John Moore's University. And I don't know about you, but I hated maths. I hated physics. It was just so boring in high school, you know, find X, no one really cares about X, but if you could find X to potentially shoot X, that would make it a hell of a lot more fun for understanding and getting through there. So what I think might be most appropriate to this crowd would be uh, the idea of a GPU cloud, uh, sorry, a GPU cloud, because uh, a lot of the issues with Pitch 4D is, one, it requires medium to high spec computing power to run all the 3D into the backgrounds. For us, personally, it's compiling it to so many different platforms. You know, Windows, Android, Mac, your phones, it doesn't just work off the bat on all of them. And in short, how do we fix this? Well, cloud to the rescue. We want to be able to just throw up an application up onto the cloud and let anyone see it through themselves, just through a little web link. And this is where we've been building GPU Cloud, our you know, remote desktop as a service. In short, you buy credits off us and you rent our machines. It's we've got you know servers over in Amsterdam. London, uh, all backed from uh, Google and NVIDIA. Uh, and in short, you can use our computers, very small price range from ranging from £1.20 to £2 an hour. So if you're not really too sure or you only need some high powered machines uh, just for a little while to either do a render, show someone uh, some of the 3D models just all online and you don't have a powerful machine, then you can just rent our machines. But that wasn't enough because it has a lot of overhead because it's a whole remote desktop. You don't need Windows, you don't need all the other apps. So this is where we've partnered with Yonder Cloud. So Yonder Cloud is one of like one of the major players in this realm now by doing software as a service dedicated to basically getting 3D technologies into the hands of everyday users. 
So what does it do? Well, in short, one platform for multiple customer use cases. So desktop as a service, application as a service is what we're purely uh, working with them with. Uh, via, uh, VFX rendering. So if you've got you know, long render times, you don't want to do it on your machine because you've got your business to run. Let's just throw it up onto the cloud. You get given the video uh, afterwards or any of your data processing afterwards. Um, cool. So in short, this is just a short little run through going through it all. You log on, you launch the application. It's so powerful because all we're doing is we're doing all the processing inside of the cloud and then just streaming your video just straight to you. It works through hot points. You know, this is just running on a terrible little uh, tablet, um, Android base in a coffee shop. I think uh, we was in Starbucks maybe at the time. And in short, yeah, you can get all your data, everything online do all your game development, do all your virtual production, all for the price of basically two pound an hour. It's not too bad considering that our machines cost about, about you know, two to five grand a pop. Uh, so you just offset that into the cloud. So let's go from that. So the use cases for this you might be thinking, okay, what's the point? Well, academic research, creative studios, which is what we are, what, who we want to work with further by basically spreading the wealth, spreading the technologies, gaming studios, or one of the best things that I see it as is people just want to get into the industry. They want to try it out. They want to see what it's all about. Cool. Just rent a couple of hours off us. We'll even give you a couple of hours for free just so you can try it. Let's jump on one unreal because you don't want to spend 2000 pound on a uh, laptop if you can't actually use or, you know, want to use the technologies, but this is where pitch 4d comes in hand. Again, one of the issues of pitch 4d is we give our technology to a client but then they might not be able to run that on their machines. So we just upload it to the platform very easily. So I'm going to do the one thing that you should never do inside of a presentation and just do a demo. So I will try and click this. Opens up into a web browser. So you, all you need to do is just give a link to your clients. It spins up the virtual machine, loads everything in the background. It's not a Windows desktop because it's not a desktop application. It's just a single application. Loading all the uh, configs. And here we go. We've got a fully 3D application running in the cloud, but then just streaming to your desktop through any web browser. So this isn't like a pre-rendered video. If I want to look left, I can look left. If I want to look right, I can look right. And we're just running our applications inside of this service. Cool. So let's go back from that. And I believe that was literally all I had to say about the matter. There we go. I won't go on to any more. So I've been uh, David Tully, one of Scene Graph Studios, pushing Pitch 4D with Yonder Cloud as the technology provider. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Oh, well, thanks, Dave. I think Tracy had a question. Go on. In fact, I was in the, the stop chat. Um, there we go. Stop share. Why not front to me? Um, yeah, Tracy. Um, yeah, I just put, it was just a thought while I was watching. Thanks, David. Um, I'm the least techie person probably on this whole session. So. Coming on this is, is is partly as well challenging my own kind of perceptions of, you know, what's possible and that kind of belief that this isn't for us, this, this doesn't apply to any of our work and trying to just like get beyond that. So I was just thinking about, uh, so my, my question was about, could we use this to create um, real interview experiences for people who are looking for work? Maybe they're looking for work in a new sector, but you just said that, you know, giving, giving people um, like a virtual tour of a workplace to try it out, or but I was thinking about having it feel more like a proper interview. So, cause we have people do mock interviews yeah. with our clients. Like, could we make funny. it feel more real and- Yeah, it's funny that you should say that. So. Going. Yeah, we're, we're actually just finishing uh, a project, basically delivering it fr on Friday, where we do virtual reality interviews. Uh, so we're building right. courses with uh, Pathways to Work, uh, who do like yeah. 
get into that space. So yeah, we've got that all boxed off, and you know, I'm very happy to show you some of the videos that we've got that have people in yeah. there, and then have basically put people into different settings. But the AI character is controlled by a human, so you mm. have two applications running. So you can ask different questions, leading questions, and then get feedback from that point of view. But it's the idea mm. of putting them into different experiences, um, mm. especially because I know you mentioned that you work with people with long time unemployment. And from our discussion yeah. with Pathways to Work, it's it's not about the work because a lot of people can do the work. They just can't get through that barrier of, you know, oh, yeah. crap, I'm in an interview. It's so stressful. I haven't done this yeah. in 10 years. Uh, so that's the yeah. aim of this VR application. Uh, yeah. But we'll actually turn it into future scope is to get it through working through a web browser, open it up for everyone, and then also take away the VR. So you've just got it as a game mm. uh, functionality. And we are in discussions with plugging Alexa into it just so Alexa can talk to you but through the AR character and basically I uh, think what uh, Chris is it Chris um, I know Dan shared before uh, with Unreal's uh, meta human stuff it just looks so realistic now and things just move so fast but what mm. doesn't move fast is basically hardware uh, so that's mm. why we're pushing the cloud emphasis let's get it on the cloud rent it as credits you know very cheap credits more credits you buy cheaper it goes and then everyone gets access to it so yeah, mm. I, 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 I'd love to have a chat with you. Um, yeah. More detail. Yeah. Your... And also young unemployed people. So youth unemployment is like the big tsunami, if you like, that's yeah. going to happen now. And we're working on that as well, uh, using Kickstart, which is um, creating jobs for young people. And I was also thinking, like getting into this sector for young people, um, is also like a massive thing that we should be trying to to do so that they're then creating the experiences that other young people so it's kind of like a youth designed thing as well i'd be yeah. really interested in in how we could think about it that way because there's no point me doing it because i'll you know i'm not going to experience it am i yeah i, I was going to say like we, yeah we are putting on some training courses i'm working with beyond the cloud and also epic games uh to basically yeah. make a very small pilot using the cloud network so basically you know anyone can bring any crap laptop cool now you've got a powerful machine it's upstairs in the cloud doesn't really matter mm. you've got access to your creative technologies uh so yeah, yeah we are in talks with epic about that very thing because especially in liverpool very creative place birkenhead yeah. not so creative place but we want to be and yeah. there's so many people that can be creative it's just that barrier yeah. of you yeah. need expensive hardware, you need a good computer to get into yeah. this, or a Mac if you do Photoshop. Not anymore. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I'd love to chat more about it. Yeah. And how and how like we can so hopefully things are gonna open up and we'll have real interviews and real jobs in the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But um we'll probably always have more of a blended experience, won't we? Because we've become so familiar with this now. We're not going to go back. Mm -hmm. We're only going to go forward and, yeah, integrating it into other things as well in the future is just a really fascinating. Thanks very much. No, no, yeah, appreciate it. So, Cheers, thanks thank everyone. You. Thank you. Has anybody else got any questions for Dave? There's plenty of opportunities later anyway, um, but if anyone has got one now, we can cover it. Okay then. So, um, we'll move on to our panel discussion now. Um, so, that's... Um, I think Dave's on that panel as well. Um, Chris Morland from Citrus Suite, Natasha Sutton from the um, Business Clinic at the Full John Moores, um, Thomas Hughes Roberts, and Christine Baudry from Yoga Box. So, um, right, I've got some questions, but if anyone in the audience has got some, that's fine, you can chip in, please do. Um, so, my first question goes to Chris and Christine. Um, and how did the um, pandem pandemic impact on the business? Um, so, so, do me to jump in on Go that. On, you mean, jump in, Chris. Yeah, I mean, for, for Citrus Suite specifically, I know we're going to talk some more about yoga bots later, um, aren't we, Christine? Um, obviously, there was a there was a degree of kind of panic initially around um, whether our existing clients would be able to kind of complete their projects, whether they would shelve projects. Um, 
we were probably quite fortunate um, in that 80% of the work that we had kind of booked in at that time kind of continued to, to completion. So a, a lot of it was unaffected. Um, what was quite tricky for us, we decided to build some technology um, specifically looking at co the conference and events sector. And obviously that got hit. The 20% that went was was um, kind of solutions for, for conferences and events, although we were able to kind of pivot and transition and come up with some, some new solutions um, to take some of those events kind of online. So, so for us, it was kind of like not a massive impact to the agency itself and, and, and most of the work we were doing, but the, the most um, kind of it, it kind of interesting and challenging thing perhaps for Citrus was the, the kind of amount of inquiries we, we were getting. Lots of people kind of got in touch, probably, probably for the whole of last year, really more so than, than ever before. Um, but less less people with a firm idea of what they wanted to do, but a lot of kind of people, organizations, lots of startups as well, um, kind of looking for digital solutions to kind of problems that they 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 were facing. So I I, I describe that as a kind of challenging time, really, just because of the the kind of volume of inquiries, but also a lot of the people that were, were kind of getting in touch, maybe had no appreciation of how much tech might cost, where they were going to get the funding from, where to commercialize the products, how the, how the products potentially could uh, bring a return on, on investment as well. So it felt like a bit of what we ended up doing was kind of um, trying to kind of, kind of educate people a little bit. Um, and one thing, um, to kind of point out as well as, as a company we're kind of known i think for the mobile app development people but i don't think there's anyone in the world that's told as many people as i have that you don't need an app you know we get a lot of inquiries where people just think the app is the solution to everything oh if we had an app it would solve this problem you know in, in, a, in a you know really easy way or if we had an app it'd just make money um particularly with the kind of commercial ventures where people are looking to launch an app or a software system as a business venture, and maybe that business venture is a, a tech-based business venture. Very typical scenario for us. We work with startups to build their technology solution, and then maybe when they raise funding further down the line, they bring their own developers on, on board. Um, but I will always kind of try, I'll always kind of um, try and be really ethical about it. Um, you know, we, we've had clients that, it's a bizarre situation where one, they want to give us money and they've got money lined up and they want us to build a particular feature, but it almost kind of gets to, to, to the point where I'm turning down that work because I don't think that the, the function will work. I don't think the app will work. So there has to be a real um, kind, of, kind of need for it. So yeah, so a lot of the work we were doing was kind of trying to support organizations to kind of make sense um of what was what was going on um a lot of the a lot of the more kind of meaningful conversations that probably turned into actual products were around the health sector what well-being sector where um you know we're working with a few hospitals at the moment kind of building solutions that can help bridge the gap between the hospital and the home environments that can maybe still where the patient will still have a connection with their healthcare professional, um, but it might be via, via a, a web portal where we can kind of push out exercises, we can push out um, kind of various kind of prompts to the user. So, so um, from our perspective, I still still think we're kind of making sense of it all. It, um, we at some point will be revamping some of the technology we, we put together for, for kind of conferences where I really do, do feel for kind of organizations that and companies that were really hit and there's there's no plan B really. Um, you know, for you know, the, there's no quick, easy digital solution for you know a, an organization that maybe hosts 40 conferences a year. You know, we can put, we, you know, we did a number of digital conferences last year. We did, we did three or four of them. They, they, they went pretty well and they were pretty well attended. But obviously, 
there's no substitute for kind of a, a real kind of live event. So kind of always open to, to, to those type of discussions and to help guide people and organisations, really. So I think I'll leave it at that now. Thanks. What about you, Chris, Christine? How did it, did your um, customer profile change or, you know, how did you ensure your business was mm. resilient? Well, I, I hadn't actually got around to launching the app at that stage. So I've been working on it for quite a long time. And I think it was a confidence thing as well. A lot of the video content and I wanted everything to be perfect. So it actually knee jerked me into launching the app because there was a greater need. And that came from a response to the people who needed support, you know, the mental health crisis just escalated. Um, so I was getting, as a yoga teacher of 20 years, as well as having a day job, a lot of my existing clients or people that came to sessions, that increased. And there was a lot of new people who were just desperate for some sort of support, connectivity, you know, just a sense of belonging somewhere. So there was a big issue at the time. So it actually made me launch it in its not so perfect state and be okay with that, which was probably the biggest challenge um, and bring people along on the journey. So getting that instant feedback. So for me, the pandemic in an adverse way, I was able to respond to that need, but also launch the business and and get people engaged um so that's how it impacted on me do you think you have more um take up because of the pandemic or do you think i do but also ironically uh, and this will, obviously we'll, we've got a slot later to talk about the journey i've been thinking about this for four years and i know that sounds rubbish to most people who think god what have you been doing <laughs> because <laughs> i had a full-time job was made redundant landed in another job I was just taking me time. It was something that I, it was just a dream of mine to fulfill. And I just wish I'd have done it sooner, but whether it would have been the right time, because suddenly everybody went online. Everybody was looking to do, I think, as Chris has said, a web-based solution or should we do an app? So suddenly there was a lot more people who had that presence, which is fine because, you know, when it comes to responding to that need, it's, it's less about the competition, although it, it, it was a bit difficult to do that when there was so much on offer locally. Um, and a lot of, I think it's down to the marketing as well of who you were targeting. So where I'm quite different is mine is mainly aimed at businesses, workplaces, universities, schools. So large institutional places uh, rather than individuals who were looking to put their classes as a subscription or, you know, just make it available to their immediate client base. Um, so it helped me almost shape the model a little bit and, and tweak it, which we've now done on that journey. Thank you. Has anybody got any questions? No. All right then. So um, if we go on to Natasha, um, you've been working with students and creating a virtual environment. You know, how, how have you found that? Um, it, it's been challenging at times. Obviously, we have to accept that everyone's come at this from different abilities. So it's starting from scratch. So it's champion IT skills and um, our students come from a more diverse background and I'm also working with clients as well and we do project consultancy work which obviously normally involves a lot of face-to-face -face meetings um, and sort of building up that rapport with clients and also with, between the student groups where we would normally offer a meeting room for this to happen we didn't have that option but the students still need to meet their outcomes and the business objectives still need to be met um, I've created Microsoft Teams sites, uh, which similar functionality for SharePoint, if anyone's used those uh, SharePoint before. And basically, it's a, a private channel, so the students and the clients can talk through the informal chat, um, they can have meetings, but you can also share documents that are being worked on live. So it sort of creates that group atmosphere, so it's although you're in a room, you can have that the chat informal, you can have a, a virtual meeting, you can record stuff, you can share the documents. Um, and it's, it's trying to create what we would have in normally a classroom or an office online. Um, we found it to be really successful at the minute. We're working with 53 different businesses um, and it's allowed the student projects to go ahead as they would have ordinarily. And, you know, we can't replicate the real life, but what we can do is try and still give that experience and build up um, that rapport with clients. Um, so far, I found it really good. I and mean, we have had the odd issue with people with different technical abilities. Um, but I think that's something I can overcome. We have created frequently asked questions. For example, as I've been going along, knowing what's the common things occurring so that moving forward, if we do have to continue with the, in this uh, virtual environment, 
acknowledging the challenges before we even start the projects. I think it's a great way to get around a lot of the issues that a lot of people might face. Yeah, I should imagine that a lot of businesses um, are worried about the, the workforce and the skills that they're, they're going to have to sort of pick up ready to move, move forward. Um, I don't know whether anyone else has had those sort of challenges. I guess and that will be one of them. And um, um, how do you think the how do you know that the students are engaging and that the businesses are, are happy with the sort of the service and things? Yeah, um, well, I, you don't have to be like Big Brother, but you can be like Big Brother on Microsoft Teams if you want. You can go on and see who's online. Uh, obviously, and um, with the way with Zoom, after this call ends, everything sort of disappears. With Microsoft Teams, it stays there. So if you have a chat between the teams that stays there like a running, almost like on your iPhone, like an iMessage scroll, you can see all the messages and interactions. Um, it'll show you when documents were last edited, who edited them, who's accessed them. So you do have a, a sort of idea of how, how engaged teams are and how engaged clients are based on that. Um, and yeah, I think it's it's a, it's, it's a really great opportunity for, for students. To, and also just to mention last I'm on here, we are also getting funding uh, the business clinic shortly to get um, courses to train skill people up. So it's going to be on leadership growth. And um, so that is something that local businesses, if you've got someone perhaps who needs upskilling, that is something that we're going to be able to offer free of charge in the near future. That's great. Thank you. So that's what leads me on, um, Tom, you know, with the human interaction with technology and how you can, you know, how you can measure the impact that it's all having you know, and how effective it is. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it's really difficult in the best of times. Uh, it, it's, it's really difficult now. Some of the things I'll talk about with the, the live lab later on require access to the person. And I think one, one thing I was going to mention was is analytics. So we there is always going to be a greater use now of whatever analytics are available. And Microsoft Teams is, is a good example of that. I think that the it does kind of lapse a little bit into sort of a dystopian view of how you're looking at what people are doing. But the other, the, the, the positive of it is you do get measurable outcomes and it's always about identifying what are measurable outcomes and what you can gather and what you can interpret based on those potential data points. The downside is it doesn't necessarily capture the user experience. It captures things like usability and when people are on and offline, but you don't know anything about the enjoyment, about how they're feeling about the service that they're, they're receiving. And that's the difficult part. One thing I think there's, there seems to be quite a lot of analogies with, with lecturing actually, because we're, we're having to do everything online. Um, the things that we would usually decide or determine as being attendance aren't, aren't useful anymore. So I record all my lectures at the start of the week, release them. No one watches them at the times they're meant to watch them. You come back later on and see that they're picking them up at, you know, late at night or whatever times they do want to, want, to, want to watch them. So the way people are engaging is changing. And I think we have to be conscious of that, that it becomes a more flexible and dynamic approach to people um, consuming this content. The other thing that we found useful for maintaining engagement and, and measuring it as well is branching out to as many different uh, methods of communication and support as possible and finding out what students um, or, or consumers will be kind of using on an everyday basis. So, for example, our students use um, Discord, which is a, a gaming social platform a lot. So we reached out as well as emails, Canvas and the various other kind of platforms that we would ordinarily have as a university. We reached out as well on ones that they are typically using. We set up can, um, a Discord service for our modules and they, they contact us through there as well. And we found that to be massively successful because they are engaging with the content in a way that they would ordinarily be doing so outside of university. So for us, it's been um, changing perceptions, changing and understanding how they are perceiving what we're doing and also providing as many avenues for communication as possible. And how, how do you think this, I mean, the students, do they all quite like being on using the, the Zoom and do they like being on camera or have you found that there's been more lack of showing their face? Getting people on camera is really difficult. And I, I, we've, we have found that for students that struggle with with one-to-one -one interaction in general, for some reason, it, it's more difficult for them. I think because when they're on camera, you know, the spotlight is on them and, and it's, it's, it's harder to hide in the crowd, even though 
you know, there's, there could be very many people on, on a Zoom call. So having said that, some students massively prefer the online way of working and they're finding it to be beneficial to their mental health, the way they like to go about doing things. So it's, it's the same, it's the same problems, but manifesting themselves in different ways in the cohort. And just because we've shifted to a different platform, it doesn't mean that these problems have, uh, have increased. It's just that they've changed in makeup, they've changed in nature. And for us, it's been about managing, you know, which students are now struggling, but now which students are actually doing really well and, and just providing that same level of kind of um, outreach, I guess. That's interesting that it's not really changed. It's just a different, a different day with a similar problem. Yeah, I mean, it's changed for us in the way that we have to prepare our content uh, and the, yeah. the workload's increased. <laughs> but but I think the students, the the uh, the ones that are enjoying it are, are getting along quite well. But there are, like you would get in a normal run, there are students that are, are, are struggling as well. So Do you have to change it? Um, so once you've recorded it, the, the content for this this year's um, students, are you able to reuse that again in the, the following year? So there might be less work or do you think... Uh, Data and yeah, I mean, the back of my mind, I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking, oh, if I record this well, then then I can use it next year. But I keep making references to to global pandemics and new ways of working. So I think, oh, well, I can't use that next year. It's not going to make any sense. Yeah, good. Um, so Dave, what what do you think about um your audience and um are they connecting effectively online? Uh, so when you say audience, like clients or your probably your clients audience how do they uh, how are you ensuring that the the content is being delivered and so like in short at the beginning um we actually got quite a bit of work doing 3d art galleries so we work with dot art uh, down in liverpool uh, and we basically just uh, made back-end programs to get 3d technologies so they could do virtual art galleries just through a web browser um they loved it so much and they had so much interest this is at the very beginning uh that they actually then commissioned four other projects to be able to do like you know gallery creators so students like so because they work with students of schools to do all artworks and competitions to put um their own spin on making their own art galleries and then showing art from specific categories of students so we got quite a lot of work from that and i think with everything going online it's just pushed the whole boundaries of 3D through web browsers because, again, everyone's got a web browser on their mobile phone. Everyone's got a web browser on their uh, desktop. Uh, they need just to see it. And generally, a lot of people don't need realism with the 3D content. They just want to see it. Uh, oh, that looks cool for 10 minutes, uh, which is half the battle with a lot of this stuff because now, generally, I think user engagement, especially with websites, it's about two seconds. If they're not interested in two seconds, they just turn away. So that's put a massive strain on making sure that you can load things a lot better. So I bet you're like, you know, uh, Chris uh, from Citrus Street um, will yeah, back me up on this, that they need fast content. They need fast stuff going to the device instantly. Otherwise, they're just walking away. So that's been pretty hard just to one, get 3D technologies working on every single device through web browsers. Uh, yeah, so in short difficult but yet pushing the boundaries so as you say though you've got to engage with them really quickly because if they don't in, i'm not interested straight away they'll go and um, sort of leave um so do you think things have changed since the beginning because at the beginning it was all quite a novelty everyone was oh well, i'm on a zoom call um or i'm gonna look at go to chester zoo and just be online about it after time everyone's gonna you know obviously people are getting can't wait to go out so do you think there'll be a big impact on that virtual world? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's probably going to dip. Uh, so we go back to the Spanish flu back in the day. I think that was like 1914 or something. Uh, forgive me if I get the dates wrong, but there's a reason why the 20s were called the Roman 20s. People love being together. So do you think now we're kind of using, you know, 3D technologies through websites, immersive 3D scans, uh, because we're kind of forced to, and it's a little bit of normality. But as soon as things open up, everyone's just going to flood out, gigs are going to happen again. Obviously, I wish that it could be like, you know, a bit sooner. Uh, but people just love being together. So I think it's about capitalizing, using the technologies, but within bigger spaces to show more people and just getting the technologies out there into the streets. So, which I think what's where Willow Waters is doing 
quite well or plan to do quite well. So yeah, as you say, I think it's a mixture of both, isn't it? It's just a change for us all to adapt to. So it's a little question for everyone, really. Um, you know, have you had to change your marketing strategy in order to meet the needs of your customers and to ensure everyone's still engaging? Do you think, Dave, have you had to change it? Uh, so, uh, sorry, uh, did you want me to say? Any, uh, yeah, you can. I was going to say, our marketing strategy, uh, to be honest, has been pretty shit. Uh, just because we've been pretty busy with everything, pardon for uh, swearing. Um, so yeah, we're actually looking for someone to kind of well help us out, as you know, to like either just help us run the business uh, and then yeah, do the marketing. So if anyone knows anyone uh, that would be interested in helping out, uh, I'd love to have a chat. Uh, and I think uh, Chris was going to say something then uh, before I interrupted. So after you do, thanks, David. Um, what, what I was going to say, I guess what we're really kind of lacking is those physical events the networking events and i if i look at over the years where our projects came from a lot of it stems from this is the this is the equivalent i guess of the networking event but just being in those physical spaces being introduced to people meeting people and at some point you know they turn into collaborations they turn into projects and, and clients and so kind of i'm thinking more kind of you know 12 months down the line you know we'll have we'll, we'll have gone completely online um kind of virtual you know for 12 eight for 12 18 months you know and and what will the impact be of not having those kind of physical connections and, and kind of meeting people um so from from a marketing perspective i guess this year over the last year we've probably been just more responsive rather than strategic Although the health projects we're doing now and kind of happy spaces and um, yoga bots all come from a same, the, the same place, which is company strategy. A lot of the conversations we've had over the year have just been kind of responsive to, to kind of what's going on. Yeah, um, I think, as you say, that hopefully the idea of this event today, we can all start building relationships and working together. And if there's any collaborations that come out of it, that link to um, research and development, student projects, internships, and things like that. That'll be absolutely amazing. You know, we can all come back in twelve months' time and talk about what the, the benefits of the sessions been. Hopefully, it's beneficial to everyone. Um, so, one of the things I was going to talk about was the um, sort of cyber security of it all and the the, the securing um, networks and how if anyone could just jump in any time or you know, you know one of the issues that what one of the businesses came to us was you know what the people i'm dealing with i'm guessing tracy might have this sort of concern is that they they're working in mcdonald's of the, they're in mcdonald's car park accessing the wi-fi on their mobile phone um to to do the training um so you know how can this have an impact does this have an impact on people or is, is cyber security an issue what do you think um i don't know here chris chris do you have any do you have to link build that into citrus suite or is it not really been an issue for you um i suppose there's there's kind of risks with with anything you, you would kind of be involved in there's kind of there's risks for kind of organizing a conference and an event. I think it, it's all always about kind of managing that risk and kind of having having a plan to kind of mitigate um, any issues. I mean, I, I could talk specifics about technology and encryption and and, and double factor authentication and, and stuff. But I think um, I think it's just about being kind of open and transparent and just kind of assessing kind of any um, any security issues really um i guess you know a, a consultant in cyber security would have um you know a very focused take on that and and and, and th there'd be lots of stuff we could all be very very fearful about <laughs> really but i i think it's i think we're you know it, yeah it's just about um kind of finding finding that balance really between you know kind of what what needs to be done to kind of maintain kind of business and social kind of continuity and the kind of the, the risks of that being on a digital platform 
thank you. I think there's a couple of questions in the chat, so I'll just have a read through them. Um, so Keith, I think has Tom covered your question um, around who owns the content? Yeah, and um, Tracy, it, the difference between platforms and network and the real relationships and the human emotion that she worries about, um, which definitely, you know, you're, I'm, especially I'm a right chatterbox, so I love talking to people. So, um, and Leon's the same, this is the interaction and having the tactile meeting. Um, has anyone got any other questions to, the, to our panellists? Or, or anything they'd like to raise at this time? No? Okay, so should we go and move on to um, to the presentation from Yogabot and Sit for Sweet? So Christine and Chris, hand over to you. You can share your screens. Yeah. Do you Do want to go me? first, Chris? Or yeah, me? shall I just give a bit of background? Yeah. Where, uh, from, from our perspective, and obviously there's, there's kind of your journey, um, Christine, as well. Um, when I kind of reference the conferences and, and events, um, what Sister Suite were probably doing in 2018 through to 2019 was more kind of looking at software as a service solutions. So what I mean by that is kind of not building these one-off platforms for clients and getting commissioned to do specific pieces of work, although that's always important to, to us. Um, we looked at kind of our technology and the, the kind of source code we had, and we were looking at kind of opportunities for almost kind of packaging that up and creating bespoke versions of back-end software platform and mobile apps to solve solutions in different sectors. So we were looking at building kind of healthcare apps that would be licensed to organizations. So essentially we've already built it, we've already created the app and then different organizations will license them and we'll do some bespoke functionality um, for those apps to kind of launch them for, for various different user scenarios. So um, in late 2019, we, we kind of built some deals in the kind of conference and events sector that, that would have seen this technology launch for, we were looking at about 20 conferences and potentially as many as 100 uh, events in the, more, in the kind of entertainment sector. So we built this platform called the Appy Spaces. Um, the idea, rather than clients commissioning us to, to make an app, and that could cost £30,000 to £300,000, you know, they're quite expensive to build solutions from the ground up. We were talking about clients not paying us any upfront cost at all, and it more being kind of a, a monthly fee to kind of reuse some of kind of our background technology um, for particular um, client requirements. So we were looking to go live in the conference and in, in the conference sector and that just got hit completely. So our initial case studies we were looking at um, just weren't possible at all. But thankfully, lucky us, we'd been talking to Christine for probably about, I don't know, nine months, 12 months. Um, and so during that time, Christine was one of our guinea pigs looking at the kind of well-being functions of, of our platform. Um, so um, I, I think that's probably cue for you, for you, Christine. Generally, the well-being functions for, for us were looking at how we could support kind of yoga instructors, personal trainers. We're also kind of um, in clinical settings as well. We had a lot of pre-built functions um, for kind of communicating, for creating content mm -hmm. and kind of, deploying that within apps so yoga bots came out of some of those trials yeah okay so uh, leading on from that I think it was probably a bit longer than that to be honest Chris so just a little bit of background to put some context to it uh, I've worked for over 20 God, plus years in regeneration so I worked with Lee quite a lot in the past and my role was always about managing the funding and the business support framework. So I spent years helping companies set up, obtain funding, investments, watch them grow. And I always had little ideas of my own, but never really had the time, or it just wasn't the thing to, to bring them to fruition. At the same time, my alter ego was as a yoga teacher for 20 plus years, meditation, and I had a real passion for it. But I, I toyed around with the idea of opening a studio and thought, well, I don't want to do that because I do enjoy the other side of the job as well. 
So I wanted to create a virtual studio. Uh, and I'm going back to 2016 um, when I was constantly getting people coming up to my desk with a lot of musculoskeletal issues or, you know, I was designing little programs for them. And workplace stress was becoming a major issue. I think it was like 69%. There was a study, a small business survey of people who felt they had work-related stress, whether it be through anxiety, depression, or various other issues. So I was thinking something needs to be done here. And it was a bit of a hot topic at the time. And bear in mind, this was pre-headspace and all those major multi-million pound solutions that are out there. So I, I have sat on it for quite a while. I'm gutted now. Um, so I was playing around with what to do. So I did explore the idea and concept of VR, AR, and all these other emerging things that were coming through because we also, at the time, hosted the International Business Festival. So that was bringing a lot of ideas around innovation, the future world of work, new technologies. Um, so I was getting sight of a lot of those and thinking, how could they be, be applied to help me realize this dream? And then I had a chance meeting with Chris, I think if I remember rightly, during the festival to say, well, I've got this idea, but I haven't really got a clue how to, how to apply it or what application to use. Um, I just know what I want to achieve. And that's when Chris first suggested the idea that they were starting to build happy spaces. Um, and then I went off traveling through the day job. Then I was heading up international. So I was on the road, but still had this concept. And every now and again, we'd check in with Chris. I was then made redundant um, and thought, right, I need to do something about this idea that I've bores everyone to death with over the last few years. So I started to put it into action. So I'll just share the screen, um, but just thought it'd be useful to give that bit of content. And this was all pre-pandemic. Can people see this? Can everyone see that? Yeah, we've got yeah. it. Yeah. Go back a bit. Okay, so bringing that concept of uh, yoga, meditation, and all those lovely ancient techniques that I think everybody should be taught from a very early age, bringing that together with the business world that I was part of, I thought, you know, the workplace hero, it'd be great to have some sort of solution that can help employees, staff, and also university students to address some of those concerns that were starting to, to rise up and up. So the idea of yoga bot, so it, the idea is about almost the chat bot was around at the time. And if you think about the little Android figure, which was a bit of a buddy, a help, a tool that could help people access meditation, yoga, or just things that could help their mental, physical, and emotional stress and, and well-being 24-7. So the boss idea, the little dog, it comes from my old dog, because I think animals just provide that unconditional love and emotional support. You know, if you don't like dogs, then, you know, you, this won't relate to you whatsoever. But I'm a bit of a dog obsessive now. I wasn't when I was younger. But I always found that, you know, even if you're just stroking an animal, they just calm you instantly. And there is supposed to be some science behind that as well. So that is a deliberate idea that represents my old little dog who used to sort all my problems out when I was having stress through the day job. And then we looked into the concept of the everyday hero. So you've almost got the workplace version of the app and then just the general app that can be accessed by anyone. So just a little summary on that idea conceived back in 2016, just which was a bit of a, a concept at that time. Um, Chris will go into more detail about Happy Spaces, but it's a content platform that provides virtual health spot guide and mentor. It addresses physical, mental, emotional health and well-being. So a little bit about the app, it's split into six sections. So just this week, this is actually all transformed now. So it's a bit of a data presentation, I haven't had time to update it. But some of the main facets around addressing mental health, emotional health and physical health and well-being is around the mind, it's around the physical body, it's around the emotions. So I'd split it into different sections. And I also think there's something about, you know, you win the morning, you win the day. If you wake up and you consume your mind and your soul with negative news or, you know, with bad foods and things like that, then that's going to set you up for the day. So the idea on the inspire section is there's maybe something that kickstarts your day that's in a really positive way to get you fired 
And also there's good science behind that to show that creativity can be born. It helps the way the brain functions ideas and just helps to provide that clarity for creativity to flourish, um, which is great, you know, from an entrepreneurship point of view. Um, and then the mini bot aspect, I just think there's a long term goal with this. Every child should be, and they are starting to do this in schools now, should have access to those basic techniques around meditation, managing stress, and just being able to breathe properly. You know, such amazing science behind being able to breathe pro properly. And we're not really equipped with that from an early age. I think we're taught maths, English, we're taught all these other things, but we're not taught the basic rules and tools for living and the tools and for living and, and life, really, to help us cope with certain situations and you can definitely see that in the rise of the various other issues and, and problems that kids are suffering so there is a long-term goal to try and get yoga bots as a broader brand not just through the app into schools and to create community champions that can help to to share those messages uh, so that's a bit around the mini bot which is the end goal so to speak so it's a cost-effective platform solution so this is just a little shot of the platform um, which is a content management system. So within that, it gives me the ability to add video content, audio content, PDFs, conduct surveys, a range of content, which was quite fascinating to me because it wasn't just about delivering a yoga class. You're able to target it to certain people. So if I've got someone who falls pregnant or they develop a, a particular issue or they've got certain contraindications that prevents them from being able to do traditional stuff, I can specifically target content to those individuals and also those companies and those workplaces that are tailored and bespoke for the individual. So that is really, really useful. And that's also about the comms platform. So if a company or a university have got particular messaging, especially around Mental Health Awareness Week, or if there's something that's quite personal to the workforce, you can tailor that messaging to those individuals. So you can almost create separate companies and sub layers within the system that enables you to do that. And that to me is, is the USP and is the difference in some of the other platforms and other solutions I was exploring. And it's easy to use for someone like me who can just about send an email. Obviously now I'm an expert in everything. <laughs> Chris will start laughing because I, I give them hell sometimes with very stupid questions from my side. But it is great because you've almost got that expertise in, in the techie experts like Chris and Co. And you've got someone like me who just hasn't got a clue about that world. But I'm more just about the content and what I want to try and get across. So that's quite a nice partnership to have, um, which I've really found very useful and has just helped me realise that idea in a quicker time frame. And just a bit about our values. We say we're a good business, so we are still growing. As I said earlier, we did launch just on lockdown. They were pushing me, and Chris and Steve were trying to push me to launch soon and saying, it doesn't have to be perfect, get the feedback and build from there. Me being the perfectionist, and I, I think I've gone on about it for that long, to people, I wanted it perfect, and that's not the way life is. Some of the other issues that I faced from a business perspective when lockdown happened, struggling to just get a business bank account, uh, registering it with the International Property Office and, and Intellectual uh, and trademark and things like that. There's some of those barriers that you've got to overcome. And then there's the marketing aspect, which takes up a lot of time, requires a lot of expertise. And you know, David touched upon this and it's having that program strategy, uh, which was a bit, it's a bit difficult in the yoga world because you are faced with the ethical issue around should yoga be online? And, you know, there's a lot of naysayers in, in the environment, in the yoga world around online classes, which is now completely shifted. So that has had a major cultural change in the last year. Um, and then just a little bit there about mini bots, which help support community wellbeing programs, which is what hopefully the profits gains from the businesses that take it up will be ploughed back into those community programs to help every child have access to it. And in the app, it's not just about getting kids to be glued to the, the phone or the device. There's self-care challenges. So it's things like go and spend time with nature. There's little worksheets that you can print out to do 30 day mindfulness challenges and do some interactive stuff as family as well, you know, if they're in those environments. So it isn't just about keeping people glued, it's about giving them that first step towards well being. So, this is the new look and user experience. So, since the pandemic happened and since we launched last year, we've been getting feedback on user experience. So, it has been getting used by AE and ICU workers in the hospitals. And they've also shared some of that content with, with uh, patients. 
which has been quite useful because there's a lot of meditation, there's a lot of breath work, which is very simple and basic stuff. And also those inspirational videos and, and nice ambience music. Um, and the feedback has been that's actually gone down really well. And it's been a positive addition to the, especially to the A&E teams who just didn't have the time or the capacity to deal with some of the, the constraints the pandemic has thrown at them. Um, so we're working on that new user look and that's being launched this week. And that's going to launch, you know, that's going to evolve again in a few weeks, probably. Also, I've got a personal ambition to increase the company and university subscription. So this is the, the one sales pitch I'll give. Um, <laughs> it's a nice affordable solution to have in your pocket. And it can also pair heads if you've got a big user base, like a, a, a huge workforce or, or a huge student population. It can be designed in a way that it can be fairly cheap in terms of headcount. So what better way to invest in, in those people's health and well-being? And then I've also got an ambition to take it global. One thing I've got is using the business connections I've made over four or five years across Europe and putting the city on the world stage. I'd spoken to a lot of people about this concept and especially in the likes of India and the States where there's a big drive for med medical and healthcare technology is to try and explore that in the future, but we just need to go on a little bit of a journey first and take it to that. And that's me, so. So I don't know if Chris, you want to add to that to the more specific happy spaces? No, I, I think it just in, in summary, just to kind of um, clarify that, 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 yeah, it's kind of our platform that's kind of being used to, to create that as a product. The idea for us is to kind of scale our business with the amount of the volume of projects we can handle and the solutions that we can handle to multiple clients rather than it just being 10 clients a year you know there's a 100 200 clients we could support um and to boil it down at its simplest i guess it's a it's an app version of a, a concept like kind of word press or Squarespace. For us, it's an app building platform. We'll build the app for clients, but we're kind of cherry picking from pre-existing features and then kind of customizing it for, for per clients. So yeah, we've got some of our kind of bigger um, um, kind of ideas and, and, and kind of um, a lot of kind of opportunities to take that forward at the moment. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, I've just mentioned in the app there that I've actually signed up for the seven weeks, right, haven't I? And I'm loving it. It's great. It's really, um, it's great because you can just use it when, you, when you're when ready. Um, you can, this class is set, but if you don't want to, you can't make it for a class. It's all the recordings, isn't it, Chris? And um, you know, it's, I'm not very technical either, considering I work on a digital project. Um, <laughs> I, just, I just know the people that can do it. And so it's very user-friendly space. Um, but if anyone's got any questions, you know, please feel free to either put them in the chat or ask you know, um, out loud. Um, but we're right on time virtually, which is quite surprising for our quick break. So everyone can run off quick, get a drink. Unfortunately, we can't share, you know, that's one thing we miss, isn't it? Standing in the line, getting a coffee or a bacon yeah. and chatting to people. It's definitely um, not the same when you're in, the, in your house, you get up and you stand in your kitchen, make yourself a cuppa. Come back, but if you want to send us all afternoon tea next time, we can do that. You know, I'll give you our address, no problem. Oh, you, well, we've done that. One of the um things I set up in at John Moore's was um a cluster group for women, um, and engineering. And I said, oh, Can we have afternoon? We, we did the launch, we did afternoon tea. And um, Anthony, who's our, our manager, said, I think that's that's a bit girlish, isn't it? I said, It doesn't matter, we can still have afternoon tea, and it was fab. But um, yeah, that would be definitely a, a nice one in the future. Um, but yeah, so if everyone um, takes 10 minutes, quick break, and please come back, because we've got lots of other exciting things to talk about. Um, we've got the live, live lab demo, um, how to meet up in virtual reality. Um, we've got high impact demonstrating their platform. And we're going to talk about marketing strategy from um, Dr. John Brown from our Jan Brown, sorry, from um, our local business school. So we've still got things to talk about, so please come back. Thank you.
Hassan, you there? Can you hear me now? Oh yeah, that's better. Yeah, that's all right. I came back to life. Oh, I'm sorry. I was, I wasn't sure whether it was just me, and it was really, and I was thinking, I, I can't hear, you. can't understand. Yeah. So, say what um, we'll what we'll do is we'll run through the rest of the um agenda, and if you are still okay to just catch up at the end, is that all right? Okay, okay, I'm fine. Yeah. Is that okay? Good. Thank you. Thank you. Are you finding it useful? Have you been able to listen to everything? It's okay. <laughs> I'm okay. Liang, you've joined us now. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's great. Hopefully, everyone will come back after their break. <laughs> Just everyone's gone to get a drink and. Have yeah. a Comfort break. Wait be a sec. Right, is everyone back now? Yeah, hello. I'm just going to turn my camera off because I'm eating and you don't all need to see that. <laughs> Leslie? I think you're on mute. Maybe chatting. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, we can go straight to Tom to do a demonstration about the, of the live lab. Are you there, Tom? Yeah. Let me just share my screen. Thank you. Okay. Can everyone see that? Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, um, yeah, so hello again. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the Liverpool Immersive Experience Lab, which is a, a platform that we have in, in Byram Street campus at Liverpool John Moores. And this is um, primarily a platform that's set up to evaluate immersive experiences. But as we, as I'll go through this kind of uh, slide deck, I, I wanna show that what we have is a set of equipment and a set of metrics that can be applied to understanding the human experience in whatever walk of life that might be. So that might be in reaction to a website, an app, um, or even just understanding things like shop floors or how people interact with environments. So that I'm, I'm quite pleased that there's a few things that people have already said leading up to this that I was going to focus on. It's this obvious idea that we're not just getting used to a new way of working, but we're probably going to have to get used to this 
moving us into a, a way of working that's going to stick around for a while. And I'm going to try and look at a, a couple of, or we'll look at an example where, where that is, is certainly the case. But I think as well as the reaction to the pandemic, there is just a natural move into a more virtual world whether that's a world that is seamlessly integrating augmented reality into our, our view of the world around us, or whether it's a seamless transition into a completely virtual one because that's where people will start to spend their time. There's gonna be a natural need for us to understand how people react in, in these kind of environments and how we cater and tailor and change our behavior in order to um, provide a service to people in these environments, but also to understand what they're doing in it, what the, what the human kind of condition is when they're in those environments. So as I say, the Live Lab is a platform for studying human behavior. The focus is on immersive tech, and that's certainly where, where my uh, research interests lie. But the equipment that we have has been applied in a, a wide range of, of use cases. So we've got things like an eye tracker. We've got um, physiological devices for, for reading things like stress. We've got face reader. We've got uh, all that stuff that can work within a VR platform. And we've got an experimental um, uh, space where you can set up your experiment and, and in, in normal times uh, view people as they go about interacting with your application. So things like the eye tracker, for example, is probably the most um, popular bit of equipment that we have because we talk with companies and we talk with, uh, we're focused on providing consultancy as well as doing research. And the eye tracker is probably the most commonly applied bit of equipment that we have. Uh, and it, just to give you an idea of the various use cases that has been applied in the, the pair of uh, glasses that we have um, in, a, in another university, but the, uh, the, the actual equipment has been used to understand how people with dementia interact with their homes. So no tech, no um, uh, augmented virtual reality stuff, immersive stuff at all. It's just about understanding how people are uh, reacting and interacting with their local space and changing over time, because that's what they were interested in monitoring. So if I can just give a quick example where, where something that, and, and I think all of you will see examples from your own work as well, but over the course of the pandemic, Pepsi uh, had to move online as we all did, but they had to do things like their product designs and continue to do things like their product designs. So their solution to this was to give all of their uh, designers VR headsets and 3D printers that they sent out to their homes. Uh, and then they could design their new products in virtual space. They could print them out and do the things that they would normally do. So it was a natural reaction to what we are having to go through. What they have found though, is that this worked so well that they are likely to continue to do it because it's more collaborative. The range of tools that are available in a virtual space is much greater than the range that they have access to in a real space. And that they are likely to continue doing this method of product design over the, over the next uh, kind of way that they're doing that they're working what the important bit that for me when i read about this in, in the news article was that they see this as as a a means by which uh, that they will have to get used to understanding how their products work in the virtual space so bringing their consumers into the, the virtual reality platforms and using it to evaluate the products yes but also understand their reactions to if it was a virtual product because they see the future people will interact with brands in virtual spaces. So the sooner that they start to get to grips with this, and in some ways the pandemic has probably pushed us down this road quicker than we would have gone ordinarily, the, the better it is for them because this is where they see people going in the future. So the problem really boils down to the distance problem, right? It's, it's that we don't have, and people mentioned this in the chat earlier, that there's no way for us to gauge personal, interpersonal reactions to online content or to each other. Uh, and this is no more true than when you're doing a lecture and you see a panel of initials on a Zoom call. Uh, and you know, I, I probably see from my webcam that I'm still waving my arms around because that's what I would do if I was doing a lecture to try and maintain people's attention. It doesn't work now, it doesn't, doesn't uh, have the same effect that it would ordinarily have if I was doing this uh, in, in a real space. We still need to check whether or not users are consistently engaged with what we're doing. We have a requirement to do this because otherwise there's no point, right? We, there's no point to us to continue to do this if we're not making sure that it's working. We need to know when they lose interest. And as I, I mentioned earlier, the, the, the issue now is that interest is not necessarily maintained within a one hour slot, but it might be sporadically spread across the week. 
Is that good? Is that bad? We don't really know yet, but it's certainly a new way of being engaged that's more, um, more flexible and certainly more, more granular. The problem really is that we have a less controlled environment. I can control what's on front of me. I can put where my panels are and I can, I can do that, but I don't have any control over where you're watching this, this, this presentation. You, I don't know what distractions there are in your local environment. I don't know what else might be hindering your ability to engage. So this is a, a series of obvious problems that we now need to kind of look at and solving when we're evaluating that user experience. As a few people have mentioned, and as um, uh, Liang will, will talk about following this session, we have a potential solution in social VR. There is a, a barrier to access. The, the HMDs are still relatively expensive, although things like the Oculus Quest is a bit more reasonable so for people to be able to engage with. But there is certainly a, a movement into providing uh, distance-based networking events um, or things that we would do in a local space, but over distance now using VR. Uh, things like MetaHuman are really interesting and things like um, Facebook, Oculus are also pushing ways of trying to read facial expression because they see that as the main stumbling block to trying to get people to be able to do what they would ordinarily do at a networking event in a virtual space. So what we, the, the point of these last couple of slides really is that there does seem to be a move to moving uh, not just things like what we're doing now, but also the, the the local network events and things like that to, to a virtual platform. So there is going to be a need to understand this broader experience within these more magical spaces, um, because that's that's what they are. They're, they're not just being able to point and, and talk. You can do all kinds of other stuff in a virtual space. So what, what do I mean by, by the UX when we talk about the user experience? Eye tracking is, is probably the domain of what we would ordinarily consider um, usability. But now, uh, we are moving more in kind of the, the HCI field and have done over the last few years to, to talking about this in regards to the experience as a whole and not just behavioral outcomes, but physiological and emotive outcomes as well. So what we would get usually is, uh, if you can see my mouse cursor, is something like an eye tracking study where we might have a website where you want to know where the, the major points of interest are in it while they're looking at the recipe here. So that's, that's good. They're looking at the pictures and the ingredients list. The idea is that you are evaluating the flow of your, of your web page, you're seeing where things lie and whether they make logical sense and whether they're capturing people's attention. That might tell us, well, lots of attention over here, so we might place a button or something like an advert in this space here, so we're making sure that people are interacting with it in the way that we want. The UX goes a little bit broader than that because we're also thinking about physiological outcomes, workload, stress, excitement, and emotive outcomes, whether they're happy, frustrated, uh, confused, and so on. There's a danger to only taking a narrow view of, of the user's experience that I'll, I'll come on to in a moment. This is what our, uh, our eye trackers look like. Um, the reason why we have a mobile set rather than a fixed infrared tracker that you usually place at the bottom of a monitor is that we wanted to evaluate augmented uh, reality experiences. You want to evaluate how people are using a tablet. When you do AR evaluations, you're not just evaluating screen space, whether people are poking and prodding at the tablet or phone screen, but also how that screen space works in relation to the environment around them. So there's a lot more going on when you're evaluating these, these environmental based experiences. So camera at the front, uh, gets a camera feed, the infrared track is here on the front, overlay that with your eye tracking data. So this is typically, eye tracking is the domain of usability and evaluating websites and applications. We're seeing a greater use of this um, and they're, they're going very, very common now in, um, in big companies, um, particularly to understand things like shop layouts and understanding whether high value items are being noticed, whether advertising boards are being noticed, that kind of thing. So shelving layouts, points of interest and tourist locations. This is kind of what we've got down here where you can, you can evaluate an environment, overlay the eye tracking data onto a map so you can make sure or you can check that fire escapes are noticeable, um, warning signs are clear, that kind of stuff. This is an example of a project that we, we run a student project actually uh, for, for a company uh, to evaluate their new menu design. So I just threw this in here very quickly to show you an example of this. And they redesigned it with some, what was called uh, menu psychology, I believe he, he called it. Essentially, this is checking the boxing and also notice the use of the, the foliage around the edges. 
in the old design. Instead, they placed it uh, kind of through the flow of the menu. The idea is that it guides the user's eyes. So you're checking whether or not they're looking in the order that they are they are looking at. I think some people on this in the session may have been participants in this study. Um, but the 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 idea is to check that they are uh, uh, seeing high value items, that they are going uh, flowing through the menu in a, in a logical and, and sensible kind of way. We can do this in VR. So the idea is that you'd be able to do all of that without having to make mock-ups. You can make them virtually. You can, you can create them in a space where it's low cost and low resource to be able to evaluate that user experience more readily. And this is what Pepsi was certainly trying to do with their, their outcomes previously. So test communication campaign, campaigns on the fly, make any alterations to it without having to actually make any physical alterations. This has obviously um, got massive applications in, in safety critical jobs. And eye tracking is used a lot to determine what is an expert level at doing something. So those, pair, those glasses were also used in the study to determine um, how experts engage with a task compared to novices, finding that expert surgeons have a longer degree of focus on their task in, in um, fixed spots as opposed to novices who kind of flick around quite a lot. Face reader is also something, so a lot of these that I've talked about require interpersonal connection, right? We have to have our participants in front of us to be able to get eye tracking data. Face reader is a, is a nice example of something where we don't need that. We can just capture a camera feed of someone's face and then run it through the face reader um, um, application and then determine what emotions they're feeling. So this is the main grouping of emotions that we have. Um, the kind of list of um, major micro expressions that we exhibit. I always find it interesting that only one of them is positive. One of the, only one of them is happy. I don't know if there's an evolutionary need for this, whether the, we, we lapse more to negative ones. But this is, um, this is the emotions that we get out. So you run the tracking data through it. If I just have this very, very quick video before I finish this session. And you will get a, an outcome of all the things that people felt during the time of interacting with your application. You can correlate that with events. So if they clicked on a certain event or they were doing a, an online interview and a particular question made them spike in frustration or, or made them angry, you can pinpoint what, what events these, what these triggers are and then deal with them post kind of experiment. Just to, to finish, the, um, I mentioned that if you focus on one metric, this, this can be problematic. If we combine eye tracking with uh, face reader, we actually see that yes, their attention is down here, but whilst their attention is down here, they're really frustrated while it's down there. So we might not want to place any buttons where their attention is, is focused, but they're also frustrated and angry. So we need to combine metrics in order to get to the truth of the user's experience. So we need to be able to correlate and data triangulate to get to a realistic picture of what people and users are doing. Um, this is our, 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 our physiological device. This measures EDA. This is electrodermal activity, which is stress. Um, it's, it's actually a measure of sweat. When we get sweaty, this is an indicator of being stressed or being happy or being excited. Um, and we can plug that onto people as well and do the same kind of thing, correlate it with events, see what's causing people stress. Another one that requires personal contact, but it's not really uh, doable at distance, but that's uh, an example of the, of the equipment that we have. Uh, that's everything from me. If there are any questions, please give us a shout um, and I'm here to answer them. Thanks, Tom. Does anyone have any questions? It's really interesting, isn't it? Um, okay, should we go straight through to um, to do a demonstration on the um, virtual reality meeting? Um, okay, uh, let me share my screen. Okay, so uh, so first, let me do a, a self-introduction. Uh, uh, so I'm Dr. Liang Men, and I'm a lecturer at School of Computer Science and Mathematics. Uh, uh, Tom and I are working in the same group, uh, it's computer game development group. Um, as Tom mentioned, the VR might have a great potential in supporting our uh, like collaboration, in supporting our meeting uh, in the VR. Like the, like like if you. If you experience uh, with the, like everyone is currently using the Zoom meeting, seeing each other from the 2D screen and 
we all know that's not enough and we want to have higher level of immersion and we want to have the feedback from the students or from other people in the same meeting room. And um, uh, also, uh, you know, the current VR technology is far from perfect. And um, uh, it, it's, if you recall what uh, we can potentially have in the movie uh, Ready Player One, the, the, the technology currently just, uh, currently we have just, you know, it, 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 it is much worse than, than, that, than what we expected. Uh, to have. Um, in, in today's um, uh, demonstration, I will just go through two projects. One is our Space VR, which is a, a commercial product uh, free and available on the market. Uh, it's a social VR platform. And the other one, uh, Lemo, which is my own project. It is also a multiplayer uh, VR project. I'll go through them to, to, uh, uh, to, to show you what you can do potentially with uh, our current knowledge and uh, uh, equipment uh, technology available uh, in the VR. So the first one, the OutSpace VR. Uh, the OutSpace VR is a social platform founded in uh, 2013. I, I think it's a Canadian uh, company. And uh, the OutSpace VR, the product first launched in uh, 2015. And um, uh, it's not very successful uh, if we consider the number of users, because uh, uh, you know the VR market is not uh, very big at that time, and and um, the company uh, was acquired by Microsoft in two thousand and seventeen, and it it is a social VR platform, which means uh, you can organize events and you can meet each other in the uh, virtual venue. I'll, I'll go through some of its features. Yeah, so- Are we both default, Jack? Are we default? Are we default? Are we default? Oh, twins. Like we've got the same shirt. Oh. Yeah, so uh, everyone in, inside it, they can move, they have their audio available, they, uh, they have the avatars and the audio is actually 3D spatialized audio, which means uh, you can hear where the sound comes from. And there's also a uh, sound attenuation. And you can personalize your avatar, you have the default avatar if you don't personalize it. Uh, so you will probably look the same with others. And uh, this is actually a, a footage uh, I shot uh, for a VR meetup I organized in, in, in last week. Are we both default, Jack? Let me go to the next slide. And uh, another feature, if you want to organize uh, some uh, presentations, some demonstration in the VR, uh, this feature is definitely needed, which is um, uh, you can show slides, right? Uh, the feature within Outspace VR is you can stream your browser, uh, 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 the contents in your web browser to the virtual reality, right? This is, uh, this is uh, shooted for one of our tutorials, uh, uh, which carried out uh, in, in last week. Um, and you can see we can like stream the canvas page uh, to the virtual screen, but, uh, but you cannot directly control uh, the slides within the uh, virtuality. You still use your mouse, use your keyboard to control the browser, and then you stream it to the VR. Uh, th this is what uh, I, I make make it working uh, within our space VR. But for some other social VR platform, uh, it m may be different. Like it may, may be more convenient, may give you more freedom in controlling uh, these kind of things in within the virtuality without. Uh, swap between the PC and the uh, VR. And this is another feature since you are able to stream your web browser, you are also able to stream videos uh, from YouTube or from other like video platforms. Uh, the quality is quite good, I would say. And uh, you can also stream slides uh, if you are using Google Slides. So, I, so we did uh, like carry out two of our lectures uh, from last week uh, for, for one of our uh, virtual reality modules uh, with which everyone, like every student and every tutors 
have a, a virtual reality headset. And uh, you also have the laser pen. Uh, so you can point to the slides. You can also use the laser pen to point to other person in the VR to draw their attention and they can see their point, uh, they are being pointed. The Outspace VR, it, it is an online social platform. So it also provides some like warm up activities. Uh, for example, this one, uh, you, can, uh, you can play with the basketball. Um, but as I said, the VR uh, technology we have currently is very limited. So most of the things, most of the virtual items in the virtual reality, they are not interactable. You just, uh, you just, you just see them and you, you can feel them, but uh, they don't react to your action. Like uh, for example, the basketball, these kind of interactable objects, uh, the, the number of them in the VR are, are very limited. And um, yeah, another thing, if you consider to organize virtual events, uh, it is the uh, venue and uh, the, uh, whether you will be able to personalize the meeting room or not. Outspace VR have uh, provided some like finished uh, meeting room for you to choose or meeting environment for you to choose. And on the basis of these environments, you are also able uh, to create your own word or you know, add or modify some uh, items uh, within the uh, uh, provided uh, spaces. Let me go to next. And uh, I've written uh, like a, a tutorial or report uh, if you are interested to organize uh, an event using Outspace VR. And here is the link. Uh, it, it did spend me like uh, one or two days to figure out how to uh, how to use a, a day, uh, web projector to stream the browser content into the virtual reality. So it, it's not very straightforward, but, but yeah, it's, it's not very difficult. And as said, there are many other social web platforms and Outspace VR is just one of them. For example, uh, there is Meeting VR and uh, they, uh, there is also the big screen VR. I, I've tried the big screen VR. It is mainly for, you know, for, for viewing uh, films uh, within VR with others together. But, but it is, you know, the social feature of, of the big screen VR is also very strong. Right? And each of these platforms have different uh, uh, features. And for example, they support different capacity uh, for the number of attendees and uh, they support different like, uh, like kind of platforms. Uh, the Outspace VR, the, the one of its advantages uh, is it support not only the VR, but, but many other platforms like the phones, like the Macs, like the Windows. So even uh, you don't have a VR headset, you can still attend the event. It's just like a normal 3D game, not immersive, but uh, you can still uh, attend the event. So uh, some questions could be, uh, does everything that like, does every attendees uh, have to use the VR to access the meeting? No, it depends on the platform. The, some plat VR platform, they support uh, not solely VR, but also some other uh, uh, available platforms. And is VR meeting better than Zoom meeting? Uh, well, I, I wouldn't say like definitely yes, but uh, it does provide some uh, additional cues uh, for the presenters, for the uh, for the observers, right? You can see uh, who is there. You can see their head movement. You can use your hand movements uh, to attract their attention. You can use the laser pen to attract their attention, and uh, you can even use some like body uh, posture. For example, your head movement uh, or or gesture like a thumb up. Uh, you know these kind of thing we can. Uh, we, we simply, we, we just don't have that in the Zoom in, in these like uh, kind of non-immersive uh, meeting platform. And uh, I, I, I do believe in the future, like with the advancing of the technology, we do have more potential uh, in the VR. And this is uh, one of my uh, project in, 
in the uh, virtual reality. So it's called Lemo, or in Chinese, it's Lemo, which means touch happily. And so it's a multiplayer uh, music creation uh, VR. So they, both of them, they have their gestures tracked, they have their uh, head movement tracked, and uh, they can see each other's gestures and uh, they can interact with the same music interface at the same time to create things together. So the Lamo is basically a platform uh, for me to investigate how to design the virtual reality to support the collaboration uh, in VR. Uh, I, will, I will show you a brief video and that will be the end of my demonstration. Lamo is a shared VR and they have their gestures being tracked. And like they can use pinch and stretch to create the music interfaces. And uh, yeah, they can use like bare hands interaction like click and to make music. They have, they have some freedom uh, in terms of controlling the music features uh, like the instrument, like the tempo, like the pitch. And um, based on Lemo, I like I tested some different uh, configurations. For example, how the sound uh, attenuation can impact people's uh, you know the behavior in terms of uh, collaboration. Like, will if if I made the sound drops much faster, will they stay closer when when uh, during the collaboration? Right, right, something like these. You know, we we really have like limited ability to modify this kind of physical features in the reality, but in the VR, it provides, it provides us that ability. So we might uh, be able uh, to impact how people behave uh, in the VR more than we can do in the reality. Uh, if you want to know more about the Lemo project or about my research, that's my website, www.menliang.ml, and that's end of my uh, demonstration. Thank you. I will stop the sharing. Uh, thanks, Liam. Does anybody have any questions? Really amazing. Thank you. No? Okay, so should we go to the next one? So this is um, Simon Sloan from High Impact, and he's going to demonstrate um, High Impact's potential solution. Hi. Um, thanks again for the invite, um, and thanks to everyone who's presented so far. Um, really, some really interesting stuff. Um, definitely getting a few ideas for ourselves out of some of them. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay, hopefully you can see the presentation there. So why we're here, I guess, is because we've gone through quite a lot, um, as I said at the start, um, internally at High Impact as an education provider. We have a team of teachers who are used to going out into schools and delivering exciting curriculum focused workshops based on tech and science and all kinds of exciting things. And that's usually a very physical thing. They go into a school, they're in front of the classes or they're helping the teachers deliver. Um, and it's all planned into the, the, the school's curriculum uh, based on their resources, etc. And as soon as we knew schools were going to be going into this uh, uh, sort of you know, complete shutdown or blended where they've got some kids in, some kids at home. Um, obviously, that changed everything for how we delivered our contracted days to those schools. Um, and we could have completely um, folded at that point and just said we, we can't deliver anymore. So uh, we, we obviously looked at uh, how we were doing those, uh, those deliveries and came up with an alternative plan, but also the other part of our business is we're a consultancy for those schools. So they come to us for advice and training their teachers on their delivery. So that became a, a thing as teachers aren't used to delivering remotely to their own classes. Um, so, um, so that was something that, that we had to, to quickly learn how we you know, gave them the tools and the skills to do that themselves. Um, and also sorry, have... Can I just interrupt you, Simon? Yeah. Um, is the screen meant to be black? Because we can only see a black screen. Okay, hold on. Let me try again. Thanks for letting me know. That could have been a really dull presentation. <laughs> <it>? <laughs> okay. 
Is it still blank? It is, yes. Okay, no worries. Let me, maybe it doesn't like that particular platform. Let me try one other method. Do apologize for that. Okay. How's that? No, it's still black. No, oh, that's very odd. Mm -hmm. um, you can see your cursor. Very strange. Okay, let me just try. Is that any better? No. Oh. Simon, I have no. the presentation open here. Do you want oh, me to that try? That would be amazing. That would be great yeah. if you could do it then. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Obviously, some technical glitch going on at my end. Let me just stop sharing my screen. I'll do the talk and then, Dion, if you want to run through that. Thank you for that. Good job you're here. There we go. So, um, so yeah, if you can go to the second slide, Dion, that would be great. Great, thank you. Okay, so as I was saying, um, the other parts of our business are we have an in-house media team um, creating sort of traditional mar digital marketing content, um, video, photography, graphic design, that kind of thing, but also specializing in virtual tools, which we've been doing for quite a few years now. And we have an in-house learning and development team, um, which um, has over the, certainly over the last year started to kind of branch out from just doing the, the virtual tours and adding some interactivity and, and use using those for some other um, more creative purposes. So um, we'll share a few of those today and hopefully you'll get some ideas of um, things that you can use for yourselves. Okay, so if you can move on. Um, so one thing that uh, we've started to do lately is to um, look at our delivery in things like this in Zoom calls. Um, and yeah, we've all been there when you've been demonstrating something on Zoom and you're sharing your screen like I've just had there, you have technical difficulties. And, um, and particularly I've found, you know, when, when I'm demonstrating video content or 360 content and 3D content, it's a nightmare. And you, you're showing something that's really high end and really professional looking. And when you share your screen, typically it's stuttery and it doesn't look great. Anyone who's done that will, will know what I mean. It's, it kind of degrades the quality of the product you're, you're showing. So um, one of the things that we've been um, doing, um, if you can move on to the next um, slide, Dion, is looking at how to um, improve um, those uh, Zoom and Teams and Meet um, events. Um, and yeah, for, for just general chats and things, this would be absolute overkill. But in some cases for ourselves, we want to be able to deliver um, Zoom style events, but to have a, a sort of professional look to it. So. Um, now, you, you may wonder why I'm not doing that today, and partly that's because the kit is in use for a, a live stream as we speak. And also, um, whilst you can operate the stuff yourself and present it, you know, for me, uh, my brain likes to just concentrate on doing one thing. So I like to have someone in the background who, who does all the, the technical wizardry for me. Um, so I'll show you a few um, screenshots and uh, examples um, in a second about that. But uh, what we've uh, started to do is to use higher grade equipment, so better microphones, better webcams, um, streaming um, uh, control boxes and uh, software. Um, and none of this stuff's really expensive. If you were just going to use it just to jazz up how you looked on a, a general call, yes, it would be, you know, there'd be no point in doing it. But if if your delivery needs to look professional and you, you, you're used to delivering in that style, um, then there's stuff here that you can you know, very affordably buy into. Um, we do have a live studio here, but some people buy into that and rent space off us and we can operate all the stuff for them. And sometimes we've had schools even who have contacted us and said, we need to be delivering really good live um, information to our, our kids at home. And uh, we wanna be able to do this ourselves. We can't afford to have you guys come in and do it for us all the time. So we've recommended the kit and the bundle and the training program for them and they go off and then do it themselves. So a lot of that's down to the, the software. Um, and if you can just, um, just scroll forward one, Dion, thank you. So just a few examples of um, our own in-house use of it. Um, so down on the bottom right there, you can see one of our teachers um, who's created a, a live lesson and you know you could sit on a Zoom call and speak to kids, but as, as most of us, 
um, will be aware, you know, you need engaging content and kids particularly, they're used to, you know, they have no attention span, they're, they're, they're very impatient and they like stuff to be visually engaging and lots of interactivity. So we're very keen to make sure that, you know, with teachers being, you know, delivering stuff from an office um, remotely for them, that it wasn't just somebody sat on a Zoom call um, and maybe sharing their, their screen every now and again. We wanted it to have this kind of almost sort of like television studio style so they can bring in graphics um, and they can have um, you know, captions that pop up and you can see in the top left there, that's our managing director. And um, recently he was delivering uh, an update which would normally go into schools and speak to business managers and head teachers in person. And obviously can't be doing that at the moment. So he um, created a, a live stream event, um, which we put out several times throughout a few weeks. Um, and um, that was designed to, to give people lots of opportunity to, to just get the updates from our business and what's going on and what things are relevant to them. And he wanted it to feel like a studio kind of thing, but he wanted it to be live. Um, and one of the things I'll come to in a second is um, sort of faking that live stream or part live and part pre-record. Um, so in that particular case, it wasn't live at all. There was a live stream, but all the content was pre-recorded, but as a live kind of event. So we left in mistakes in his, um, in his, when he's talking, um, when he speaks to people and brings in guests, it's a very chatty kind of feel to it. So it does feel like a live thing going on. And we did still have the questions coming down the side and we had somebody who was able to respond to those by text. So, um, so it still had that kind of live event feel to it. Um, and then with down the bottom left there, that's uh, an outside um, health and safety company who use our studio for delivering um, their health and safety to, uh, I think that was South Africa and Malawi. They had clients over there um, who they'd normally fly out um, and actually, you know, that, that would cost them an absolute fortune to do that. And they can't even do that at the moment. So they you know, rented our studio space and we put all the technical stuff in place to allow them to still have that kind of engaging delivery, um, as you can see there. If you just go back one slide, Dion. Sorry. Thank you. So, um, so some of those things I was talking about there, just bringing in things like captions, um, putting up reminders on the screen. Some of the, you know, some some of this stuff that I'm doing in, a, in just like a PowerPoint presentation can be done in a, in a much more professional kind of um, looking way um, with um, live stream um, software. And you know, linking that into Zoom calls is is really really easy. Um, so. Uh, that's something we found personally useful and we're getting a lot of people who when we deliver that stuff they say oh, i'd really like to use that for myself so even school teachers as i said are getting in touch with us and asking for for bundles of of kit if you can move on a couple please dear so uh as i said there um different types of live streaming um we we started off lockdown by delivering webinars to to schools to try and um, brief them and get them ready um get their, their google classroom set up and you know, make sure they were pre prepared um, for what they were about to go through for a few few months which has turned into a, obviously uh, a good year um so um that can be from uh, a studio like ourselves or in-house um it's 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 very easy to do it just takes a bit of te technical knowledge and that's certainly something we're, we're very happy to talk to people about as to how we got on learning and what types of bits of kit we've trialed and what what works best at different budget points um, you can blend live stuff. So our teachers, when they're creating their live lessons, they are part live because they do like that interactivity. They like um, teachers to be able to ask them questions from their class and to be able to answer that in real time. But they like to bring in video content. So we've got one guy who's um, a beekeeper um, and he was designing a lesson that was all about bees and honey and all that stuff. So um, he right at this time of year isn't great for, for beekeepers. So he we used stock footage and footage that we had filmed at other times to, to bring in so he can he can do his live presentation, but then pull in some content that uh, that is much more engaging than if we were live filming a bunch of sleeping bees in the winter. So um, you can also completely fake them, as I said, um, that we've done that um, with our uh, updates from our managing director. Okay, if you can move on one, Dion. Um, training was um, another thing that started to come to light for us. Um, we've been creating um, virtual tours for a long time and we've never really worked out a good way of building in um, proper training or valuable training content into them until um, a year and a half, two years ago when we started to work with different platforms. So now what we're doing is, um, is, is building in training content that links into learning management systems that gives um, a sort of fail um, a safe to fail environment um, and a yeah, really good uh, quiz card, um, 
treasure hunt style um, elements to, to a virtual tour. Um, and that's become really useful, obviously, over the last year with training companies struggling, um, particularly um, anything that's usually classroom based is now either not possible or, or they don't, people don't, you know, people get very nervous about being in uh, classroom environments with um, lots of other people. Um, something else that we found was um, some people in like the construction industry and other sort of hazardous industries, their training isn't very realistic and they found their learners weren't engaging with it when they went on to site after their training because their training had been in a classroom and you know for example with um, excavator drivers they would train in the classroom then they'd go into the car park and there'd be a digger out in the car park and it does some cones around it and they'd be talking about it in this environment where the digger never is and they're never going to operate it and there's no hazards or anything like that so it you know it, the, the learning just didn't happen or it certainly didn't happen for everybody so with a with a creating virtual content then we can film stuff that's on site or use cgi um, generated stuff um, and and really sort of put those hazards in place but in a safe way so people can feel that they can experiment with things they can learn without causing huge amounts of damage or killing people um, and also training requires staffing resources um, and the, you know the flip side of that with virtual stuff it's once you've created it yeah it may be a bit more expensive upfront to create it but yeah once it's there it's there to use as often as you like and can be available all the time um, we can build in gamification into it um, and something we're starting to do in-house here is um, when we have new staff um, usually our hr manager will create a like a scavenger hunt for them so they can learn their way around the building and they can uh, meet people and get challenges set and all that kind of stuff so it's um so it's, it's quite a, a, an exciting way for for people on their first down the job but they can't do that at the moment because uh, most people here are, are based from home and we're looking at, so we've started to build a, a sort of virtual version of that. So we can use the virtual tour of our office, but we can build in content into there. So we can build those challenges in. If you can just skip ahead, sorry, do on one slide. Um, just actually, if you go one more. Thank you. Yeah, so for example, going into our media room, normally Georgia there, our, our head of media would be you know, in, that, in that room, ready for that person in person and be able to talk to them. But um, you know, in, in the virtual world, you know, we can embed you know, a video of her talking and explaining her department or setting a challenge or something like that um, in that room. Or we could even have a, a virtual version of Georgia standing there who comes to life when you click on her, that kind of thing. So we're trying to still keep the human element to it and a bit of engagement um, and also still let people find their way around the building. So it's a really good way of virtual on, onboarding. Now if you can go back one slide, Dion. So this is an example of a, um, a virtual training um, tool that we're, we're putting together for a, um, a training company in the um, food and beverages industry um, and they wanted sort of 360 content so behind this is a 360 image from a bar and they're training bar staff so um, there's various things you can click on in there there's uh, questions that pop up like this um, all that data it can either be used as like refresher training or inductions that kind of thing if they've got a learning management system at the back end it can store that data and record it so then their hr people can then look at who's passed which training modules and all that, all that kind of stuff so you can see at the top there there's sort of uh, that's the sort of game element to it is it's got a countdown timer it's got their scores um and what they still need to achieve in there and a progress report at the bottom there so it's got um it's got all those kind of engaging elements to it rather than it just being a, a powerpoint presentation for example okay if you can skip on a couple Thank you. Okay, so um, virtual events. Um, this is something that's come up um, only in the last few months for us, really, um, was uh, as we were building things like the training, uh, interactive training tools, we had um, contact from people who usually host events. When we talk, when I'm talking about events here, I'm, I'm thinking of exhibitions, conferences, that kind of thing, um, rather than a Zoom event. So um, I think someone else was talking about this earlier um, with, um, people still like that feeling of exploring when they have an event it's still nice um, if people are exhibiting rather than just being a person on the screen to actually be able to go up and see their their graphics their visuals um, maybe even speak to them or at least watch their videos so we um, were approached by um, the uh, world chamber over here who um, and actually the last event that i attended before lockdown last year was their um, virtual it was their um, sorry real life skills show for, um, for high schools and uh, there were hundreds of exhibitors in there including ourselves and then all the high school kids come from the area come in and speak to everybody about the different um, careers options and uh, their industry and all that kind of stuff 
So um, they wanted something that was along the same lines, still felt like a real event, but obviously it was in the digital world. So um, if you can just skip to the picture on the next screen, Thank you. So this is an example of one of the stands we're building into that. So um, so as a pilot event, um, which goes live, um, I think at the start of next week, actually, so it's almost complete. Um, this is Chester Zoo stand, they're one of the exhibitors. So we'll basically build a fake stand for them um, and put that into um, an environment, which could be a CGI one. In this case, we've got a virtual tour of, of the venue that they're, they're using. So we're putting it into a real building. Um, and then um, this content will all go out to schools in the area and they'll be able to go into the, um, the venue, go into the middle of the, the sports hall and have all these stands that are surrounding them with all the wonderful graphics, et cetera, and they'll be able to go up to Chester Zoo or High Impact or um, I'm trying to think some other people are in there. There's a gym and there's a manufacturing business. So they've got people from different sectors. And when they get to that stand, everything on it can be interactive. So on that Chester Zoo one, yeah, where you've got the more info um, graphic um, on the front panel there, that will link out to something um, the screen at the back that will have a video playing on it um, and when you click it, it the video will pop out and it will be their careers information that they've put together um, their social media links will, will all be active um, and there'll be other web links in there so um, the other things that you can do there you can build in people into that stand you can build in live web chats as well if the companies have got that facility so everything can be as interactive as as you'd want it to be i think the only thing we can't do is give away freebies um, which i think is Probably the biggest disappointment to kids going to any of these shows is that's what they want is the freebies off the stands. And um, if you go back one, please, Dion. So there are some, when, when we started to look at it, we were thinking, oh, what's the next best thing to a virtual event? But then we started to think, actually, there's some real good benefits to a, a virtual event over a real thing. So, you know, the things like um, I put on the screen there, there's no setup time for people to have to come out and set their stand up, they can probably have a much better stand than they would be able to afford, you know, rather than just having a couple of roll banners, you know, they can have a, a mega stand that would normally cost thousands to put together. Um, they don't have to worry about staff taking time out of their day to come over and run the event. Um, there's no logistics and also, you know, one of the biggest things from, uh, from Wirral Chambers point of view with theirs is normally it's a one day event, but this is something they can make available for, I think they're going to do it for a, at least two or three months um, just to give kids in all the schools the opportunity to um, jump on it and, and explore it. And they can do that from home with their parents as well, which is quite nice. Um, and they go and they can go and talk about this business they've seen or this particular industry they're really interested in, in exploring and the, the uh, careers pathway or the, the education pathway that would be required for it. OK, if you can move on. Thanks, Dion. And again. So virtual tours, as I said, have been around for, for a while now. Um, as with anything um, that's kind of new and exciting, when it first comes out, I think um, you know, anyone who's worked with VR or AR will, uh, will agree with, um, at, at, at the start, it looks amazing. And you know, either the price point or um, other things aren't in place to allow people to really use it in a beneficial way. So it's only now that uh, things like VR and AR are starting to become genuinely beneficial and people are seeing it in, in the real in the real world and their day-to-day their -day lives and that's something we're seeing with virtual tours you know we've been creating them and selling them for for three or four years but um a lot of people just got them because they were new and exciting and didn't do anything interesting with them the last year has taught people that they need to have online content so um something that may have either been just a, a nice to have is now an essential thing so they can't show off their venue they can't um showcase you know, space, they can't sell space or they can't um, give people an understanding of what their working environment is like. So and at High Impact, we're always about looking at what's the most engaging um, way to do. We don't want to just put in a virtual tour for business, leave them to it. So we always try to try to help them you know, maximize it and put in some really interesting, interactive and engaging content into there. Um, also repurposing it. We've got uh, a lot of things we've done a lot of work with football clubs and their stadium um, suites um, before and now a lot of those um, we've, we've been speaking to about how they can repurpose the same content because um, they've already had it all made they've got this um, expensive 360 degree content from their suites how can they show off their covid safe measures or how can they build in training for staff who have been on furlough for the last year and need to come back in and, and refresh their skills and that kind of thing um, and also editing it with new branding information if they're trying to sell sponsorships and things like that. Um, also, there's you know, advising people on the right kind of virtual tour. There's so many different ones. There's 
3D, there's walkthrough, um, first person view style, um, there's branded experiences, there's all kinds, and they all work differently for different people. So, um, so we like to try and make sure that people understand the differences before they jump in. And you know, we've seen some really, really bad ones, you know, the sort of Google style ones. I was looking at one from a, a Liverpool hotel the other day um, from one of our competitors. And as you walk into the door of the hotel, the very first point, there's two arrows on the floor and they both point backwards out of the building. So you can't even walk into the building and just, you know, there's some really, really you know, poorly executed tours and um, it's, it's, it's important to get it right because I think it's better not to have one than to have one that, that doesn't work correctly. And if you can just skip on a slide. Thanks. So this is an example of, um, so the bottom left there, that's the um, screenshot of a virtual tour um, at Port Sunlight in one of their museums. So what they wanted was, you know, they wanted the virtual tours, but they wanted to pull them all together and you can't we can create a virtual tour of the whole of Port Sunlight, it's a massive area, it wouldn't be feasible to do it. So um, we built it into like a branded um, environment, as you can see in the top left there, it's got their fonts, it's got their colour scheme. Um, we've got some drone technology, it's a 360 drone image with interactive points um, within that, so you can click on the different venues around it, and then that pops up with um, some content like you can see on the right hand side, which again is very branded um, and explains about that uh, particular venue, and also links out then to the virtual tour. So it's kind of bringing three different stages all in one platform that they can then host on their, um, embed on their website, uh, or send out on social media, that kind of thing. Um, have I got any more images after that, Dion? No, just some content. Um, so um, if that if that explains everything, that's great. I can show some of those kind of 360 environments in action if you if it doesn't make it clear, but hopefully the screenshots um, make it clear. And I'm not even sure my screen sharing is working. So hopefully that was um, clear and helpful to in, in some respect to somebody here. Um, is everyone happy? Do they, do they need to see a, a virtual screenshot? What does everyone think? I can send some links through afterwards if you want to send stuff through as a follow up. If people do want to have a look, that's fine. Yeah, that'll be good. Okay, then that's great. So um, next up is um, Jan Jan Brown from the Business School, and she's going to talk about marketing strategy. And um, so I'll pass you over to Jan. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Leslie. Um, like, thank you for inviting me this morning. And um, I'm from the business school um, at John Moore's. And I know Natasha's been talking to you this morning about the, the developing business, the Liverpool business clinic that we're running now. And the philosophy behind that is that every undergraduate and postgraduate student will eventually be working on live projects with industry. So that's, you know, putting theory into practice. And, and I think currently um this is a really interesting op um, opportunity to really start to work across boundaries and connect stakeholder groups together in a bit um, more detail um I'm, we're currently working at the moment with 240 final year undergraduate students and they're working on 66 live projects um with business consultants as well so we're, we're trying to work across those boundaries and I think um, looking at the last talk it's like oh there's so many things we could do there um, to be able to connect and I, what I'd like to show you today is, is is just two slides about our experiences in the business school but also how we all together could work much more effectively as a, as a team and look at where those opportunities are so I'm just going to share my screen and move my, my panel. Okay, so why, why is this important? Why are we talking about marketing strategy and marketing communications? Because I think the last year has given us some really big challenges. Um, <laughs> and from on, on a Sunday being told that on Monday, you've got to use technology when you're used to face-to-face -to -face teaching and working with industry to then go online um, has been incredibly challenging. And, and you know, uh, for people like me, maybe I, would, I needed to be forced to do some of that. Um, but it also shows the weaknesses and, and where we need collaborators to be able to, to offer um, experiences which are high quality. Um, so again, it's that idea of, of you know 
maybe we need to work better together. And, and this has given a really big opportunity for wherever you sit in that, that ecosystem from student to university through to um, the businesses in the Liverpool city region to really think about the marketing strategy behind that. And, and, and really, it, you know, as a marketer and as, as a business person, this is, what, this is what most of our students are working on at the moment with their businesses, is, is really this, is, things have changed out there. And therefore, the, the marketing strategy behind that needs to really be reviewed. And there are some things which are going to be more difficult to do, but there are loads of opportunities that, that can be taken to make sure that, that, you know, that build back better, you know. And I think there, it could, there's some more potential exclusive inclusive um, opportunities that can be had here. So most organizations have pre-COVID had their business plan. Most, most universities and teachers had their pre-COVID, how we were going to teach, how we were going to plan lessons, how, what we were going to do. But that's had to change during, during these COVID times. People have had to learn very quickly about how they're going to, they're going to do business in, in these changed times. And that has led to, to organizations really looking at their marketing strategy is, is who are their stakeholders? How is value created with those stakeholders? And how are they, how are they gonna keep connected in, the, in that last year? How are you gonna keep that? Whether I say whether it's students, whether it's working in a business clinic or whether it's working with, the, with clients out in industry. And, and again, it's that contact and having those networks to be able to look to see how agile those networks are, how people are working in that and what is required in that has really thrown up some interesting um, experiences. Um, and I'll explain one that the business school is exploring in a minute. And this has led really to organizations really thinking about what is the value proposition and, and you know, social, economic um, and, and technological. What, what, it, what is it that people are, what is the value add that everybody is actually adding? And in the changed environments, that might, have, that might be different. That might be that the, the, the proposition has changed and that they're looking for more stakeholders to come into that. But, but re, revisiting that during these changes has given people an opportunity to say, you know, where is our competitive advantage? What can we do? Where can the value be added? And how can we ensure that we're doing that? And, and you know, for, for the university students, we're asking them to go back to the three years of knowledge and mine their knowledge, mine all the databases that the university has to offer. We've got hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of databases, looking at what all those journal articles tell them and, and using that to help those organizations to say, what, what could we do? What, could, what, what can we add value to you? And, and what, can, what can we apply to your specific setting? And, and what's really interesting when you work with the students is that this is something that's quite new to them, because in the past, in the business school, we've, we've relied very heavily on the knowledge building, but maybe not on the application side. And again, is that, that as we're build, building up our capacity to do that, we're realizing that working with live business consultants, so the cluster of projects, which is small business and wanting to build websites, We've brought, got a specialist in for that. We've got a retail specialist in, but we're working with those 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 people who have the industry knowledge to really get um, value from both ends. Value from the students because they can see how to apply, to apply their knowledge to a practical application, and then the business consultants are helping with the the client really make sure that they're they're delivering value. Because we know in, in the COVID times that, that most businesses are really busy. busy. So we, we've brought in those business consultants to help them. There's also a need to be able to set your marketing goals. Mm -hmm. What is it that you're trying to achieve? And, and again, you know, if, if I haven't put all the slides in for this this morning, but, but again, it, it might be that there is, if you're in a new phase of development or your value proposition has changed to join um, deli online delivery, you might have to be in that awareness stage rather than that in that in that purchasing stage, because we're all all in these new conditions and building up an, an awareness of what is on offer, what can be done is, I think, is undervalued at the moment. And, and this is where I'm going to come back to networking at the moment. So being really clear about what your goals are and really, be, really clarifying that. Again, there's loads of academic models on that, but I didn't want to overwhelm you. Once you know what your goals are, then you've got to define how, how you're going to take that forward. How are you going to get ideas into action? And what are the strategies that you're going to follow? 
And again, by, by undertaking a marketing research audit in these times, you'll be able to see which of your stakeholder groups are ready for which, for which um, activities. And, I'm, and I'll come on when we come on to marketing communications. And that might be really different. And, and for example, one of the things that lots of lots of businesses think that all of the all of the business students can all build websites and they can all do financial statements and they can all do do lots of things. Well, actually, it might be that that they can't do that yet, or we need they need to go on different courses before we can deliver that. And it might mean that the business students think that every business is online is is up to date with Twitter, LinkedIn, all of those things. And it might be they're not. And, and again, is being able to have that dialogue between the stakeholders in your network and being able to understand where they are in, in, in terms of, of, of their development, particularly in digital times, allows you to have that conversation to make sure that you're working um, as, as one community to build that. And that's, for, that's for when, when we've been working with the level six students, the, the final year students, that's really interesting. They did, their heads are in that 12 week module you know, you do this every week, you do that. And actually when they're working in industry, knowing how to have that negotiation between those different, those different skeletal cobbles groups, understanding the needs and what is required from those business has been, is really important. Um, and again, is and one of the things we're assessing them on is how you're progressing with your teams, how, what, you know, what dialogues are you having? How do you understand other people? within that and again you know again in change times it's slightly easier to do because people can do this digitally you can where they're working in zoom and ms teams so that they they are they can they can create meetings very quickly and i have to say it has been easier to get business consultants to come and work with us because if in the past if they had to come in and come to the university spend an afternoon it might not be worth their time, but being able to pop on a Zoom call for an hour or two with, with a number of, of student groups um, is an efficient use of their times. And you don't have to live in the Liverpool city region. You can live anywhere as, as, long, as, you, as long as you want to do this and work with us. So that gives us lots of opportunities to be able to make sure your marketing strategy is correct. Because um, often time between those two stakeholder groups or the, those, group, those stakeholder groups has been limited in the past. So that's a massive opportunity. Define your marketing marketing mix, which there's, again, is the, the, the detailed deliverers of what you need to do. So really planning what's your price, what's your product, what's your promotion, what's your physical presence, what's the processes, what's your people. And again, having a really clear plan of what you want to do to deliver that into action. So you know, ideas into actions at that stage. Then, then again, having a clear plan and you know, time scales. The time scales have changed during lockdown. Some have gone very quick and some have gone re really small. Um, and again, it's been able to really plan on that. And then con like constantly reviewing. And I think, you know, one of the opportunities in lockdown is everybody, even old people like me, have managed to get onto Zoom and do do all of these things but also as we transition out of lockdown you know which elements of the of these digital deliveries is going to be kept and which is going to go back to pre-covid times and, and and again one of the things that we're thinking of the business school is that these these live projects are just going to always be digital that we think it's better to deliver it you can you can measure things much better you can have conversations we can so we're actually thinking that that module is not going to go back face to face. We might have have a, a, a big lecture where we, you know where they all come in and we discuss in a dialogue form something, but we're not going to do it in the same way as we did. And one of the reasons um, that, that that we found this has been really useful is um, I'll give you an example how we've done this in the business school. Is one of the things that we know that our, our final year students have had really. Um, it's been really difficult for them. They've been in lockdown since last March and that all those networking opportunities that they would have normally have been undertaking, all those interviews they'd have gone to, all of those, those live events they would have gone to have, have gone. And so they've been looking for events within the university. They've been on LinkedIn, but, but they've been limited in, in that. And one of the things that we've been doing, we've been working with the Northern Power Women, 
and their Northern Power Future arm. And we've been developing a series of events and networking, what's called carousel networking events. And we started with our, our final years and we're just about to do a lead, uh, the future of leadership um, uh, events in our first and second years. And what we what, what we did is, well, we didn't do it, the, the Northern Power uh, Futures did it, because again, they were like, like high impact, they were the professionals, they knew what they were doing much more than we did, is that they pulled from the 60,000 business network, um, business people that wanted to pay it forward, that were interested in talking to students about, you know, as they transitioned out of university. And the event's been so successful, it happened on the 25th of March, is that there is further events going, BNY Mellon have asked for further further, uh, further events like this. We're, they're now doing um, Carousel Coffee and Connect events where, where we're starting to start to get these groups of people together. So we're like high impact, which we're looking at how do we get the, the, you know, the young professionals coming through how do we get them with industry? How do we make sure the university is using those right methods to match up? How do we make sure what, what, what we're teaching them at the university is, is going to be appropriate for what's, what's needed from them? And we're doing a big um, research project around uh, the value of digital networking. We think there's loads of potential. And, and so we become more of an ecosystem that's just a fractured network of things. So, so once the plan is there, the then this is this is uh, this is a chart that, that there's loads of charts like this but I thought this one was an interesting one to read is once you've got your strategy once you've got got your marketing mix you've got to then communicate this to your 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 stakeholders and, and the different groups and and all businesses have lots of different ways of doing that um and, and again, this has fundamentally changed during lockdown. And I think this is a really important thing that the university has to think about what skills that, that, that we need our students to have as they leave. And, and if I start on that, the purple section on the top left. So the first thing is, you know, that strategic that research and strategic planning, you know, how are you doing your market analysis? What's your competitor analysis? What's your location analysis? And what's your trend analysis? And, and you know, the university is brilliant at that. We've got we've got hundreds of thousands of pounds of databases. We can, they can mine journal articles. They, they, you know, that's one of our, our great assets um, is that we can do that very, very well. And, and I think, you know, working with, with businesses, that's often the, a very expensive part of the business or something they don't have, have the resource to do. And it's something that, you know, by working closer with the university, that, that's easy to, to, to add value. But there's also then all of these different, different types of communications that any business, small or big, one person, global, needs to think about, from online digital marketing to trade shows and display advertising to direct response marketing to websites and, and microsite development to mobile app planning and to print advertising. And, and an organisation has to decide how much time, how much money is going to put through each of those communication challenges not only the short term and the long term and i think as you as as organizations have had to transition online there's been a great movement towards those digital channels and and it, like small businesses will often say oh i don't have time for a website design or an app design and that might now be one of its most most important strategic developments it might be that that's where they need to go first you know and if the if the if the stakeholder groups that they are working with that's how they want to work and that's how they're going to work in the future then that needs to be a priority to that i also think that that knowing when you need to spend money to do to to make it to, to make things look professional is also really important and um and in the example when we were working with the northern power futures the biggest challenge i had is is the the, the internal sign off of the budget to allow this event to go we knew it was going to be great but getting somebody to realize that we couldn't host that type of quality event i just don't have, i don't have the skill set of that that's not my that's not my, that's not my value add but being able to see how it's delivered, be able to get the feedback, and the feedback for us was really important. Um, the feedback has been so good that we're actually going to roll out the uh, the Carousel Network working event to every level six student next year uh, because it's been that valuable. But being able to build in a research and a quite quick research loop about what's working and what's not gives it gives some of these big organisations or hierarchical institutions like John Moore's 
the 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 evidence that these things are of value you know the evidence that by by working together by including this in in your communication your integrated communication plan will allow you to see you know you know it's i'm a marketer so risk and opportunity i think that we have lots of opportunities and and you know if we can measure them we can start to look for further funding to grow those in the future but but this is an opportunity i think to really if we understand the the communication and the stakeholder networks for all of those in that in the network you want to create you'll be able to create value very easily and not try to not not try to 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 replicate that and again so i think we're in a really interesting stage of development um you know how do we move how do we create the value from school to university to maybe further research studies and out into industry. How do we connect those more effectively? How do we make sure everybody understands each other's communication plans? And how can we work on creating more value in that so we can turn those young people out into the, into the work environment in a way that they can add the maximum value? So really, that's that's it from me. That's um, that, uh, that's really all I wanted to say. Um, the Liverpool Business School is worth the start of this journey. We're not, um, you know, it, we've been doing this on and off on small, small projects in the last few years, but we really now, we, our, our intent is to grow this year on year um, and we're to particularly in, in the team format. But, you know, the business of what, this is why we're here today. You know, where is the highest value that we can add to the Liverpool city region and beyond? is only when we work with those other faculties who are who are working in those areas that we can add value to. Oh, thanks very much, Jan. That's um, really interesting. And as you say, it's a great opportunity for businesses to um, you know, use the assets that we've got here at the university and you know, gives the opportunity for the young people to bring in their ideas. And you know, obviously the, those relationships need to be managed and we need to make sure that everyone gets something out of it from both sides because you know if businesses are investing time we need to make sure that they're going to get something out of it as well but nine times out of ten all the feedback that I've had on the projects that I've worked on businesses say it's great to get those new ideas because you do get focused into your own little world of how things are normally and you just got to get your you know, engineering especially you've got to get all the orders out in, um, in manufacturing so yeah, it's really useful to have this asset that everyone can tap into. Um, has anyone got any questions for Jan? No? No? Okay, so we're sort of coming to the end of it all. You know, thanks very much to everyone that took time to present and you know, demonstrate what's on offer. You know, I'm sure there's lots more out there as well. Um, but it's an opportunity for everyone to get thinking about how you know how 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 you change in your face to face business and bringing it online and having an impact. And you know who's to say that it's not going to. Hopefully, we'll all be able to go into the real world again. But it's not going to happen overnight, and it won't happen. Won't go back to how it was, will it? I don't think. So um, the next steps we've got on our agenda are some action plannings, and you know. Um, looking at what the next steps are for people. And um, there's opportunities to speak to all our project team. Um, so if anybody does want to specifically um, co contact one of the LCR 4 start team or you know, whoever, or any of the present pre presentations today, I mean, we can perhaps facilitate that through a breakout room, or if you prefer to do, follow that up on a later date, you know, please feel free to you know, contact us and we can make those introductions if necessary and hey. um just before we get going on that might it be an idea if we just one last time i'll throw some slides up to do with um start just so we can run down one more time what it is that we're kind of about so i'll just share my screen really that quickly would be great danielle thank yeah. you yeah i'll just share screen share quickly just it's everything that we've talked about so far so bear with me one second Um, 
Right, so they're not actually coming up. <laughs> so we just carry on um, with whatever discussion it was that you were about to facilitate, and I'll try my best to get them up. So what, what's everyone thinking? Do you, you know, have you got any thoughts on what your next steps will be and you want to share them or does anybody want to speak? I will if that's okay. Fab, thanks. Thanks, Leon. <laughs> yeah, um, I've, I, I've had the time of my life this morning watching all them presentations, I'll be honest with you. It's been like, uh, I've been like a kid in a sweet shop. Some of the stuff was just unbelievable. I want to do this every single Wednesday morning if that's okay. Everyone cool with that? Brilliant. Um, no problem. <laughs> look, look, loads of really good ideas, loads of good connections. I'm I'm a, I'm an avid networker, so everyone's already got inbox messages off me and stuff like that all the way through, so apologies for that. But um, I, I just thought it was really good. I just wanted to thank you for putting it together. It's been amazing. Thank you. Oh, that's great. Thanks. Thanks, Leo. <laughs> as long as everybody's got something out of it, that's the main thing, because you are spending three hours out of your day which, you know, time is, is more important than anything. So um, that's good to hear that you everyone's enjoying it anyway. Oh, it looks like Danielle's in. Um, Has it um, worked? Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. I'll pass it over to Danielle. Yes, again, just to reiterate, thank you very much for that, Leon. It's nice to know that we've possibly added value and that you've had a good time. So, yeah, just to reiterate, we did kind of touch on this at the beginning, but I think it's important as we finish off just to remind you um, this is an event that has been facilitated by the team at LCR Full Start. As Lee mentioned, we are ARDF funded, so any support that you have through us will be free to you. Does just mean there's a lot of paperwork because nothing in life is genuinely free, but you know, better than actually paying for it. So um, we are an initiative that is, um, yeah, Northern Powerhouse ARDF funded. And we are delivered by, it says five part project partners, but the four that will be able to help you through this is myself at Growth Platform, the Virtual Engineering Centre, so you can contact Dan, who is on the call. Um, John Moores will be Lee. Um, and if you want to speak with anyone from STFC, it will be Angela Walsh. Um, and I just thought I'd put our contact details up on the screen, even though most of us know each other, just for a reference point, if you are wanting to get in contact with us at any point. I'll stop sharing my screen in a second. We'll just let you have a quick look at that if necessary. That's great. Thanks, Daniel. I mean, one positive thing out of today is that you know we've all made a connection. And you know, if there's anything that we can all work on together as a, a larger scale project, you know, this is the grounds for it for it because one of the things that Danielle and I were looking at right, right back at the beginning, there was quite a lot of businesses with the same similar issues. And instead of everyone going off spending years as like Christine has at yoga bots you think why don't we share some best practice and look to see what's already out there and let's build build a sort of like a cluster group so we can go to each other and and talk and sound off ideas and you know if there's anything that you can build on that's great so you know if we get that you know perhaps we can start pulling things together and I don't think it'll be every week, Leon, but perhaps um, in a couple of months' time, get back together and see how, how everyone's progressing and, you know, where things are at. You know, it is it's important to keep talking to people and sharing knowledge and experiences. So, um, yeah, if nobody really wants to have a, a breakout room or any further dis discussions with anyone. Oh, Tracy, do you want to speak? Yeah, I think one of the things I've got, we've got quite a few takeaway things. Some, some of the presentations were just completely like mind blowing to me. The, the, and I said at the beginning, some of the reason I came on was to challenge myself a little bit because I very quickly say, oh, that's not for us. It won't work in our business. Um, I still think some of this isn't for us. This is way beyond, um, you know, what's doable. Um, and I'm still very much in the question all the time about how, whilst a lot of this is more inclusive, in a lot of ways it isn't. And um, the digital divide still means that um, we, we've got people in, in our communities that are even more polarised because they're white. they don't have Wi-Fi at home, let alone a tablet, a laptop or their skills. So I think there is still more we need to do together somehow 
to take people on a journey. Um, and that is a resource issue and it's a connectivity issue that might be outside our control, but it might also be that we've got in our own positions, we can amplify that issue because we've got different platforms that we can speak at and be at. And, and a lot of you have got more of that than I have in this particular scenario. So I suppose it's just encouraging that kind of thinking as well, that um, if this is kind of the direction of travel, you know, it's not just a reaction to COVID, obviously it's, it's a bigger thing than that. Um, my other point was about, um, and I did put in the chat, but it, it is a point about young people who want to get into this sector and there is an opportunity. There's two billion pounds sat virtually on a table somewhere to create jobs for young people um, in this uh, pandemic. And a lot of you probably could do that. And a lot of the companies you know could do that. And I'm more than happy to just explain it to anybody, however you want to take it forward. But again, let's see if we can do something as a city region more around that um, to connect all those brilliant people that Jan's working with um, to jobs that the rest of you potentially could create for free. You don't have to pay for it. Um, Is that the um, Kickstart programme? Yeah, yeah, it is. You're, um, able to, to give us a quick overview of it, and because some people might not yeah. know about it, so uh, let's yeah. see if there's an opportunity to. It's that just yeah, it's yeah. I mean, we run briefings on it. People can just come for a brew, and I'll tell you all about it. We can send you the link, and I'll tell you about Kickstart. But it it would give you six months' wages for someone, um, you know, so you'd have them in your team for free. Um, it's a little bit convoluted admin wise, but I won't bore you with that. That's my problem. <laughs> um, it does seem that that you know the digital um, divide, and I think quite a few people have already said in the chat about that. And you know, perhaps that's something we can look at together as looking moving forward of how we can, as a team or as a group, address those problems. Because you know, where the LCR force is a digital pro um, project, and it's to help people start their digital journey and if everyone hasn't got any access to the digital yeah. technologies well that, that's a start yeah. isn't it i mean we do laugh in our team that the word if you were to word search um our conversations on email or on zoom over the last year the most common word that you'll find in our chat would be dongle um because dongles have just driven us mad um, trying to get people connected and they're crap basically <laughs> and there's so many problems with it but we've there's a lot of organizations like ours that are very stuck and you guys have probably got some answers that you can help unlock some of this stuff for us because a lot of us just don't understand even what we're talking about <laughs> that makes sense so the more we all talk isn't it that's what i'm saying definitely yeah thanks let's see what we can we can follow up on that i think leon's sent you a message there as well about that thanks for that tracy is there anyone else that wants to have a, say anything can i just echo what leon, leon said and thank everybody for the talks this morning uh really inspirational and I think it's uh, a lonely place as an entrepreneur at the moment so events like these are fantastic uh, I'm a bit like Sherry Valentine and I'm sick of talking to the wall I can't even get on the plane and go bro <laughs> so um, so thanks for everybody for, for the inspiration this morning it's been great oh that's great to hear Keith thanks very much yeah I say it's a the start of you know working together I'm guessing does anybody else want to talk to anything? Dan, do you want to say anything? For once, remember to unmute myself first. Um, thanks for a great event, Lee. I, I'm, I'm sorry I missed so much of it. I'll definitely be watching the video back and seeing all the other presentations that I missed. Um, I've put my contact details into the um, chat there. If anybody wants to reach out, please do. Um, like I say, at the VEC and with all the partners, we're usually able to offer something to somebody who has a business issue with computers in general. We don't 
even things that we don't do, like you know, people come to us saying, oh, I want a website, can you help me with that? It's not something that we can tend to fund, but enough people come to us with that question that we've got an answer that's helpful. So just please reach out and hopefully it won't be a waste of your time and it certainly won't be a waste of mine. That's what I'm paid for. So a great event and do reach out if you can, thanks. Thanks, Dan. Is Angela still here? Uh, yes, I am. I'm just just penning penning um, uh, a little note for everybody. I'm um, just my Wi-Fi is so unstable, but that was a great event, Lee. Thank you. It's, it's been so interesting and informative. Um, it also um, also makes me feel that I'm 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 doing something worthwhile in my job as well. You know that we're able to help businesses um, during these difficult times. Um, so I just wanted to reiterate to everybody that um, if if you need any help with your funding um, or need any help with with getting things with artificial intelligence or data analytics or apps, anything like that, then then please do feel free to reach out to me. And um, I'll pop my details now just in the chat for everybody. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Angela. Um, yes, yeah, so anybody else before we sort of finish and go and have our lunch? So, well, thanks everyone. Um, it's been a great, great morning. I hope everyone thought it was, it wasn't wasting anybody's time. And, you know, we are, you can come to any of the, the partners. We all work together really well. So if we can't help, we pass it on to the person that can. Um, and again, if we can't help on the project, we'll link you into some of the solution providers. And um, obviously we've got the growth platform and there's a, a wealth of knowledge and expertise within the different programs that are available through the ERDF programs and ESF programs. So, um, you know, let's all keep in touch. And, um, you know, if any, anyone's got a, a question that you think, oh, it's not really relevant, but you know, just pass it over to us because we can always try and see how it works and you know, see if we've got an answer or pass you over to the, the right person. Danielle, have you got anything else to say? Uh, no, only that I've just I've just popped a little message in the chat just to say that if anybody is needing any help at all and wants to get started with Start, um, please feel free to contact me. But given that my position is also in the growth platform, and we help with business support in a lot of different areas. If you have any questions, even if they're not really related to today, feel free to talk to me anyway, because even if I don't know the answer, I'll be able to point you in the direction of a colleague that does. Thank you. Um, I think that's it then. We've recorded everything, um, so we can get back to anyone. We'll go through it and see if there's anything we can pick up on and uh, make sure that you're actually from something um yeah i think that's it do we all just leave now <laughs> thank you all so much for your time hope it's been thank useful you. for you all oh, thank you guys thanks very much thanks all well done, danielle leslie cheers thank, thank you. you danielle do you want to stay on and leave yeah sure i'll um i'll stop the recording now thanks <laughs>